So guys what if god like Naruto and Femme Sasuke had slept on bed overnight movie? The retrieval team that went after the traitor Uchiha Sasuke returned with success, of the six that were originally sent out to retrieve the Uchiha, four were critically injured, one was badly injured, but was not in any serious danger, and the remaining member had only a broken finger, despite the various injuries they suffered they were all healing amazingly well without any lasting damage, thanks to the brilliant medical skills of the Godem Hokage, Tsunade, the Slug Queen. Konoha Hospital It had been several days since Team Shikamaru had returned from their successful S-Class retrieval mission. Uchiha Sasuke now lay in a hospital bed, strapped down with his chakra temporarily sealed off, along with his Sharingan, his curse seal was personally sealed by Jiraiya making it near impossible for the Uchiha to use it, there were also Anbu guards stationed outside the door and outside the window on Tsunade's orders, Uchiha Sasuke couldn't do anything other but stare at the ceiling. A member of his team entered his hospital room with a large grin on his face, in response Sasuke turned and glared, he glared at the person who stopped him from obtaining power, the power he needed to avenge his clan, to kill his brother, that person being none other than Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto sighed at the glare and looked at him, he had hoped that his teammate would come to his senses and realize what Orochimaru's true intentions were, unfortunately, revenge makes you blind. Are you alright Sasuke? How are you feeling? Naruto asks. What do you think? Sasuke growled, well, I did say that I was going to break your arms and legs and drag you back to the village if I had to Naruto joked. Sasuke struggled and thrashed on the bed, trying to get free from his bonds as he jerked forward. You think this is funny Dobi? Do you? Look what you did to me. My chakra, the curse seal and my sharingan are all sealed off and I am strapped to this fucking bed. Sasuke roared. I told you that I wasn't gonna let you go to Orochimaru, answered Naruto. I am trying to protect you from him and I was trying to save you from yourself. Do you really think that he would have given you the power to kill your brother without a price? Think about it Teme. If I wasn't strapped to this fucking bed I'd kill you right now Sasuke sneered. What? Aksa surprised Naruto, I'll kill you, if I ever see you again dope, I'll kill you, snarled Sasuke. Damn it Sasuke, I am trying to help you, Naruto shouted. I don't need your help, I don't need Konoha. I don't need anything except the power to kill my brother, that's all I care about, you dare to lecture me. I am an avenger and you will always be a dobi. Sasuke spat venomously, you'll never understand how I feel, you were born with nothing. No parents, no family, no clan, I had all that and then it was taken away from me by the person I admired most in the world, the person I wanted to be like and surpass more than anything, my own fucking brother. So don't you dare think you can understand me, or how I feel, because you'll never be able to even comprehend what it's like to have everything you cherish ripped away from you, because you dope, never had anything to begin with, I don't want you, or anyone else's help, now get out of my sight, Sasuke roared. Naruto just sighed and left the room, the next day. Naruto stood at Team 7's meeting spot waiting for Sakura, soon, enough she came into view, thinking that she was going to thank him for bringing Sasuke back, he put on his trademark grin and walked to greet her. Hey Sakura was as far as he got before she lashed out at him with a left hook, straight to the side of his face, his head reeled back as an expression of shock contorted his features, a shaking hand reached to hold his stinging cheek. How could you do that to Sasuke-kun? She screeched I asked you to bring him back and what do you do? You almost kill him, she yelled, breathing heavily, glaring daggers into his eyes, it's a miracle that he's still able to recover for active duty after what you did. I thought you were his friend. Sakura proceeded to punch and kick him for 10 minutes before her rage ran its course, Naruto, being Naruto, sat there and took it, never once raising his fists to defend himself or strike back. Sakura looked down on him and spat at him, I hate you, Uzumaki Naruto, you're nothing but a monster, I don't ever want to see you again, she turned and stomped away, if Shed stayed any longer, she would have heard his heart breaking and seen the tears fall from his eyes. A few hours later in Konoha council room Naruto had been summoned to the council chambers. Do you wish to speak to me? Naruto said in a dead, miserable tone. This caught several people in the council off guard, especially Tsunade, this was not like the usual loud, hyperactive young ninja, who always wore a smile no matter what happened. What's wrong with Naruto? He's not himself, something must have happened, he'll have to ask when we're done here, thought Tsunade. Elder council member Mitokado Homura answered Naruto, Yes, we summoned you here he said, 
The Council has finished reading the reports that were given to us by you and your teammates, the Suna team, as well as Rock Lee and your sensei, Hitaki Kakashi's report. Although we're pleased that a mission of this level was successfully completed by a freshly ordained Chunin and a team of four Genin, we have some concerns regarding the reports on the battle between you and your teammate Uchiha Sasuke, he continued, peering at Naruto over the rim of his glasses. What concerns? asked Naruto, where a sick, cold feeling wormed its way into his gut. What has us concerned is the fact that you used a large amount of the Kyubi's chakra in your battle, and caused a great deal of destruction to the Valley of the End replied Elder Council member Utatane Kaharu. I had no choice. Sasuke was using the power of the curse seal, and in order to hold him back, and subdue him, I needed to access the Kyubi's chakra, plus, I was only trying to capture him while he was trying to kill me, which, I can prove right now, Naruto lifted up his shirt and showed the council the scars from the two Chidori, 1000 birds, that Sasuke had rammed through his chest, one being very close to his heart. Several of the assembled clan heads, namely Akamichi Choza, Nara Shikaku and Inazuka Sum, could not help but feel for the boy since all their sons had been on that team, one of them had been critically wounded, like Naruto, and many others were severely hurt. While that is acceptable, Uzumaki, we still have our concerns, namely the words of your own report, specifically when you were calling on the Kyubi's chakra, you stated that you were feeling a great deal of anger and rage, you also mentioned that the Kyubi's chakra served to intensify your anger, which, according to the reports, led to Uchiha Sasuke's current condition said the old one-eyed elder Danzo Shimura. We're aware that this isn't the first time you were on the verge of losing control of yourself when using the Kyubi's chakra. The reports from Team 7's mission to Nami no Kuni, Wave Country, mentioned your struggles against a Hyaten, Ice Release, user. Partner of a rank missing ninja Momochi Zabuza, in which as stated by your sensei Hitaki Kakashi you released a large amount of the Kyubi's chakra and nearly lost control, however, you managed to regain control in the end before you could do any harm to your teammates and your sensei, this time, however, you were unable to stop yourself before severally injuring Uchiha Sasuke which is the reason for this meeting, Danzo finished, studying the young blonde intently with his eye. Now hold on just a minute. Tsunade broke in, slamming her fists on the table, you're not going to try and pin any of the trouble that has been caused by the Uchiha on Naruto, he may have used the Kyubi's chakra but he clearly has it under control, as he demonstrated in Chunin exams, where he defeated Hayuga Neji without causing him any undue harm his apprenticeship to my teammate Jiraiya should be more than enough to abate any fears or concerns shouted Tsunade. With all due respect, Jiraiya's training with the container has not given us the desired results. Clearly the boy's emotions are linked to his ability to call upon the demon's power. And since he is unable to control his emotions, he cannot control a powerful enough amount of demonic chakra without losing control of his actions. The Uchiha's injuries are proof enough to attest to this, consider this, Danzo said, the container has repeatedly mentioned that he sees Sasuke as his closest friend, if, in his lack of control, he damaged his friend this much, what does that say about the damage he could deal to a Konoha shinobi with whom he has no connection, should he once again lose control? I've to say this would not have happened if Serutobi had not disbanded my root division or if had given me the chance to raise and train the boy properly, he finished. If Sensei had allowed that, Naruto would have been nothing more than your personal puppet, Tsunade snarled. I wanted nothing more than to train the container to become the perfect weapon for Konoha, and despite what you think of me, I always have the best interest of Konoha at heart, stated Danzo calmly. More like your own interests, if you ask me, Sum growled out, she had never liked the old war hawk. He treated shinobi like disposable tools and wouldn't hesitate to send anyone on a suicide mission or abandon them if it suited his own needs, it was a fact that disgusted Sum since her clan valued comradeship above all else. Danzo narrowed his eye at Sum, but said nothing. Tsunade, we must also consider the threat of the organization that Jiraiya reported to us, the Akatsuki, which is made up of nine S-class missing nins, one of the members being Uchiha Itachi, and a former member being your former teammate Orochimaru Kaharu stated, watching Tsunade. We are at a great disadvantage against them, we've little to no information with regards to their goals. Besides the fact that they are after the Biju, not to mention our own current state of weakness from the invasion of Suna and Otto. They can easily attack us again to obtain the Kyubi container, just as they attempted last time with Uchiha Itachi and Hoshigaki Kisame when they infiltrated the village, 
but this time all nine members may attack the village, and we would most likely be destroyed in the resulting battle. That is why I believe we should eliminate that threat to the village right here, and now, said Kaharu, eyeing Naruto as she concluded her speech. Naruto suddenly had a terrible feeling wash over him, they meant him. And you propose to do this, how? drawled Shikaku, not liking the direction things were going. Simple, as I said the Akatsuki want the Biju and they'll stop at nothing until they've obtained them all, therefore, as long as we have the Kyubi, we are in danger, what I suggest is we banish the container so that Konoha itself will no longer be a target Kaharu responded. No. I will not allow this. I will not allow you to banish one of our most loyal shinobi simply because you're afraid to fight the Akatsuki. You can't do this, as Hokage, I forbid it, roared Tsunade. When Naruto heard Kaharu's plan he felt like his heart was going to stop. He met her once or twice when he was younger, visiting the old man. While the man named Homura treated him nicely enough, the woman Kaharu treated him like the plague, her tolerance of his existence was just barely present, and had received many a glare from her, for his pranks, or his casual way of referring to the Sandame as Gigi, but when Tsunade started to shout that she would not allow them to banish him, hope started to rise in Naruto, he knew Tsunade as the Hokage would have final say and she would never banish him. But when a small evil smirk appeared on Kaharu's wrinkled old face, that hope shattered. I am afraid you're wrong Tsunade, we can do this, you see, in the village charter recorded by your grandfather the Shodem Hokage, it is stated that when there is a situation that threatens the safety of the village and the Hokage is unwilling, or incapable of dealing with it, then the village council may overrule the Hokage on the decisions on how to deal with the situation, so long as the majority of the council is in favor of it said Kaharu, still maintaining her smirk. What? Tsunade roared in disbelief, wait. Even if we banish the boy all we're doing is handing him to the Akatsuki. This plan if it can be called that will not eliminate the threat that the Akatsuki poses. All this will do, give them more power and further aid their goals, making them an even bigger threat than they are now, I also disagree, both fundamentally and professionally, with your blasé treatment of Naruto, to just throw a young ninja of our village to the wolves in this manner, in spite of all that he has accomplished, is an insult and is against everything Konoha stands for, declared Shuza, in righteous anger. Tsunade and Naruto both smiled, glad that they had some support, and happy that at least someone else could see reason. That is no boy. He is a demon, plain and simple, shouted out Ashikaga Shin, head of the merchant guild in Konoha. He had lost his only daughter, a young Kunoichi, his pride and joy. On the night of the Kyubi attack and held a great deal of hatred for Naruto, Shin's bias against Naruto prompted him to have Naruto banned from the majority of shops and restaurants that served the village, or in lieu of outright banning him, the merchants only gave him the worst things they had and even overcharged him for them. The only businesses that weren't like this were Ichiraku Ramen and Makumo Ninja Gears and Weapons Store. Additionally, Makumo Tensions, the owner of Makumo Ninja Gear and Weapons Store, reputation as the finest weapons maker in the village, made him untouchable regardless of his membership in the Merchants Guild. Also, the most he could do to Ichiraku Tuchi was to not allow him to have a site or section to build a ramen restaurant in the village, which didn't hurt the man much. Plus, although Ashikaga Shin would never say it to anyone, he was actually intimated by the old ramen chief. Ever since an incident when he had spoken badly about the Kyubi brat in front of him, he had received a broken jaw for his troubles. You lot are all fools, if we listen to you then we'll be giving the most powerful and destructive force that we know to a bunch of criminals and I don't think what those criminals have in plan for the Bijus will be for the benefit of Konoha or any other village and country in the bloody elemental continent, said Ino's father Inoichi. Do not worry about handing over the power of the Kyubi to the Akatsuki Yamanaka-san, both Danzo and I have taken into consideration that the container would very much likely be captured by them, which is why we've a plan that'll activate once we banish the container, and eliminate the threat of the Akatsuki at the same time, said Kaharu. And what exactly is this great plan of yours that will eliminate 9S class criminals in one go? Tsunade snarled out. I am sorry Tsunade. But considering how sensitive this plan is and how vital it is to the village's security, we cannot tell you now, and due to your relationship with the container, we'll inform you and the rest of the council once we feel the time is right, said Danzo with a barely seen smirk. All Tsunade could do was growl and glare at the old warhawk, seething with suppressed rage and an overwhelming urge to rob Danzo of his remaining eye and limbs. 
I now propose that we cast a vote to decide the container's fate stated Kaharu. Ashikaga Shin I vote yes, let's get rid of the demon. Inazuka Sum I vote no, the boy should nt be treated like this, as the Hokage has said, he is a loyal shinobi to this village and doesn't deserve to be banished. I've known him since he was a young pup and he often played with my own son when they were younger. Hojo Akira, a civilian politician who went wherever the civilian people went as long as it kept him in his comfortable position. I vote yes, this village will be much better off without him causing us trouble. Nara Shikaku not only is this meeting troublesome, but it is also stupid, this vote is stupid, you guys, who are for banishing him, are stupid, so I vote no. Akamichi Shuza, like Sum's son Kiba, my son Choji has known Naruto since childhood, he was even one of Choji's first friends, and if I vote yes I will never be able to face my son, plus, he is the only person that can eat more ramen than me or Choji, my vote, is no Shuza said with a slight chuckle. Yamanaka Inoichi, quite frankly I am against this entire thing, I've seen what that boy goes through in the village from his memories in his mind, when I did his mental stability test, to be perfectly honest, if he does decide to destroy this village then we deserve every bit of what we get, contrary to your belief, his mind is a hell of a lot more stable and more controlled than that Uchiha, I vote no. Udatane Kaharu you all know my reasons so I need not say them, I vote yes. Danzo my reasons are the same as Kaharu san, I vote yes. Serutobi Asuma I often saw the kid with my old man and I know he considered him a grandson in all but blood, if he saw this right now, he would be disgusted, I bet he's even turning over his grave right now, also, the boy is good friends with my nephew and he will never forgive me if I was for Naruto's banishment, plus he is also friends with your grandchildren, Kaharu and Homura, so I vote no. Asai Heida, one of the wealthiest men in Konoha who had lost a great deal of his wealth when his family home and been destroyed by the Kyubi financial, I vote yes, and I'll be more than happy to kick it out myself. Abarame Shibi Although some of the things that Kaharu-san has said are logically sound, it would be illogical to simply banish the boy and indirectly hand him over to the Akatsuki without knowing what the plan is, and might I mention, we of the Abarame clan also know what it is like to be judged simply because of what we carry inside us, so I vote no. Karama Unkai Although I am sympathetic to the boy's situation and hold no hatred for what he carries inside him, since he cannot be held responsible for being unable to control the demon inside his body much like my niece Yukumo, it still does not change the fact that he is still a danger to our village, I vote yes. Senju Tsunade, Hokage. I vote no, I will not allow you to banish this boy just because of your idiotic hate. Maitokado Homura, although I hold no hatred for young Naruto, some of the things that Danzo and Kaharu have mentioned cannot be ignored, and as much as it pains me to say this, I must vote yes. When Homura sat down he looked at the young boy who stared back at him with hurt and betrayal on his face, filling Homura with guilt. I am sorry Naruto, I am merely doing what I think is best for the village, although something tells me I am making a great mistake, Udon will probably never forgive me for banishing Naruto, Homura thought sadly. Anbu Commander. There is truth in what Danzo-san and Kaharu-san said with regards Akatsuki coming back to Konoha to capture Uzumaki Naruto, however, like Abarame-san I cannot agree with banishing him and leaving him helpless against the Akatsuki, not without any knowledge of the plan to deal with them, this boy has proven himself to the village enough times and more, even in the exams, he helped save the village by defeating the Jinchuriki Gara, I vote no. Amako Taichi. Taichi was a wealthy businessman that had earned a great deal of wealth from selling various foods and herbs in and out of Konoha in the fire country, he lost crops, herbs, land and wealth during the Kyubi attack. He also lost his elder brother who had been a janin at the time, I vote yes, the sooner we get rid of him the better. Naruto had been counting the votes and it was Tai, 8 for banishment 8 against it, now, there was only one person left to vote, Hyuga Hiyashi, Hanada's father and head of the Hyuga clan. For the next few minutes Hiyashi remained silent as he mulled over his decision, all the while though, Naruto waited breathlessly for Hiyashi to decide his fate, since his vote would be the breaker. Hayuga Hiyashi, I vote yes to banishing Uzumaki Naruto from Konoha. At this Naruto hit the ground and slumped over, his world had been shattered, everything was gone now, he would never be an accomplished ninja, never be Hokage, and never see his friends again. Tsunade had tears in her eyes but she would not cry, she wouldn't give these bastards the satisfaction of seeing her break, 
but she wasn't the only person who was angered and saddened by this, most of those who were against his banishment were angry as well. Soon, livid, was glaring furiously at Hiyashi while her partner Kuromaru growled at the man. Hiyashi, for the most part ignored Soom and her dog. Although I hold no hatred for the boy, I do think it is better that he leave. In our current condition the village can't afford to have an enemy like the Akatsuki, with him gone we can rebuild the village and our forces and deal with the Akatsuki when we're ready, perhaps with him gone Hinata will finally give up her silly little crush over the boy and start training more and become stronger like a true Hyuga heiress should be, if not, I've no choice, but to put her in the branch clan and have Hanabi be the new heiress, thought Hiyashi. The Anbu commander and Abarame Shibi just sadly shook their heads, knowing that this was a mistake that will one day come back to bite them. Shuza just sighed sadly knowing his son would be greatly affected by this. Shikaku just thought, troublesome idiots, the civilian members of the council were laughing away at how they final got rid of the demon brat. Danzo, Kaharu and Unkai did not join the fools and just kept their face neutral. Homura and Inoichi just lowered their heads sadly since they knew this was wrong. Asuma just sighed and looked out the window, he saw that it was raining again like the funeral for his father and the other ninjas who died during the invasion by Suna and Otto, it seems that once again the heavens are weeping, this time it's weeping at the foolishness of this village, or maybe it is you father, and Minato who are weeping from the heavens at what we've allowed happen, thought Asuma. Anbu. Take the Kayubi container to have his chakra sealed, and have Danzo's new cursed seal placed on him so that he can't tell anyone our secrets or techniques, ordered Kaharu, at this. The Anbu who appeared next to Naruto disappeared with him. Two days later in Naruto's apartment it was nighttime in Konoha, Naruto had just finishing packing up his few meager belongings so he would be ready to leave tomorrow, his throat still hurt from the seal that was put on him to prevent him from talking about Konoha to people outside the village. His friends had just left his apartment an hour ago to say goodbye. Along with a few others, Thankfully Tsunade had been able to forbid anyone in the council from mentioning that he was banished to the civilians and most of the ninja population until he had left, she didn't want people lining up to throw things at him and jeer as he left, the only reason why his friends knew what was happening was because Tsunade had allowed the parents of Naruto's friends to tell them so that they could say goodbye. Guy and Lee had been shouting out about the unyouthfulness of the Konoha council, swearing that they were now going to work twice as hard, so that their own flames of youth would not be dampened. Lee had made Naruto his eternal rival and vowed on his flames of youth, that he would one day help to bring Naruto back to Konoha, and if not he would run all the way to Suna and back again 100 times. Naruto could not help but laugh at Lee's vow, he was grateful to have a friend like him, though Lee may have been weird guy he was a loyal to a fault and he knew he could count on when he needed him, he and Lee were a lot alike. Both were orphans, both were weird in their own way, both never gave up no matter how hard it got for them. Both were dead lasts in their class and both had a dream they wanted to achieve. Lee I want you to do me a favor, Naruto began. Anything for you Naruto-kun, exclaimed Lee. I want you to promise me that you'll accomplish your dream, and prove that the dead last can become a great ninja, no matter what, Naruto proclaimed. Yosh. Your flames of youth still shine brightly, Lee cried, and I will become a great ninja. It's a promise of a lifetime. Afterwards Neji came and gave his condolences over what had happened, he even said that all the respect he had gained for his uncle recently was now gone, he wished Naruto luck, and also told Naruto that Hanada had been forbidden to say goodbye to Naruto by her father, Naruto of course understood and could not help but feel sympathetic for Hanada, for being cursed with a cold-hearted bastard like Hiyashi as her father. Ten Ten came as well, and told him how enraged she and her parents were when they heard that Naruto was being banished for some unknown reason. Naruto had been going to her family store for years, since her parents, unlike most people of Konoha, treated Naruto like a person, they even gave him discounts for weapons and gear when he was short of money, which was quite often, Ten Ten also gave Naruto a set of silver kanai as a parting gift, and said that they would miss him very much, leaving Naruto truly touched by Ten Ten and her parents' kindness. Kurenai also came to give Naruto her sympathy and a bento box from Hanada that she made herself. Naruto thanked Kurenai and told her to thank Hanada for him. When Kiba arrived with the others he began to rant and rave about the stupidity of the council, he even told Naruto that his mom still hadn't stopped swearing, which made Naruto laugh. Shino gave his condolences over the banishment, Naruto noted that every time someone mentioned Konoha's council, Shino's left eyebrow started to twitch in annoyance. 
Shikamaru, Asuma and Choji also arrived together along with Konohamaru, Moegi and Udon to say goodbye. Konohamaru was fairly torn up over Naruto's banishment, Naruto gave him his leaf headband saying that he can have it as a keepsake from him, Konohamaru tearfully took it and promised to keep it safe, Naruto also told him to make sure to wear it when he becomes Hokage, so that in some small way they both become Hokage. Konohamaru also promised that he would prank the hell out of Konoha for this, especially the ones who had Naruto banished from the village, Naruto just chuckled and said, give them hell Konohamaru. Konohamaru also vowed that when he was Hokage, he will disband the council and bring him back to Konoha, which made Naruto laugh again and tell him he better hurry up and become Hokage then. Both Udon and Moegi, tearfully hugged Naruto saying that they were sorry for their grandparents' stupidity, Naruto just smiled and said that they had nothing to be sorry about. Shikamaru wished Naruto luck and told him to try to not get into too many troublesome situations, Naruto only smirked at him and said he would do his best. Choji gave Naruto a pie from his mom, Naruto thanked Choji and told him to thank his mom for him, Naruto had met Choji's mother once or twice and found her to be a very kind woman, not to mention she was an excellent cook from the one or two meals he had with the family along with Kiba and Shikamaru. Asuma expressed his sorrow that he couldn't prevent the council from banishing him, Naruto thanked Asuma and told him he was grateful for his help even if he didn't succeed. Tuchi and Ayame both arrived and sensed, Tuchi swore that if he ever saw that bastard Ashikaga Shin again he would do more that break his jaw, Ayame gave Naruto a kiss on the head, much to his embarrassment, and told him to take care of himself, they also gave him a few instant ramen cups and gave him a large, hot bowl of ramen as his last meal in the village. When Aruka arrived a few minutes after the others, saying he had been pissed would have been the understatement of the century, he was beyond furious belief and began ranting on about the idiocy of the council, he was tempted to go to the next council meeting and give them a piece of his mind, it was funny to imagine Aruka using his scary big head jutsu on the council members, Aruka told Naruto that he would miss him, and told him to take care of himself, and gave Naruto a fatherly hug. The only ones that had not come to say goodbye to Naruto were Ino, Sakura, Sasuke and Kakashi, Asuma told him that Ino had gone off to take care of the poor hurt Uchiha, everyone already knew Sakura was with, Sasuke, was still being detained in the hospital, and Kakashi, according to Kurenai, was heading towards the hospital to visit his prized student, Naruto wasn't shocked at their behavior, and found that he didn't even care. When asked why, Naruto simply told everyone what had happened with him and Sakura at the bridge and how Kakashi had trained him in only tree walking and teamwork exercises. While he had seen Kakashi teach Sasuke several flame jutsu, not to mention his chidori, he taught Sakura to detect and dispel and cast genjutsus, Naruto also showed them the scars that Sasuke's chidori gave him, it was a miracle that Naruto was still alive, Asuma and Kurenai were of course disgusted at Kakashi's blatant favoritism and their respect for the copycat ninja plummeted, Guy couldn't even explain how ashamed he was of his rival. When everyone was gone Naruto gazed out the window, he knew the Anbu were there, watching him, he was not able to see or sense them, but he knew they were there, as he gazed he could not help but think about his life in Konoha, he had a few good memories, but honestly, all the others were bad, it was then Naruto realized he needed to know something and if he was going to leave Konoha tomorrow forever then he might as well find out tonight. He was going to find out about his parents, it had been something Naruto had wanted to know all his life, when he asked the Sandame, the old man told him he had no idea, however, Naruto just knew that the old man was lying. He had also asked Tsunade and Jiraiya, but they said they didn't know either, again, he knew they were lying to him, the pervert may have been a convincing liar, but Tsunade was as good at lying as she was at gambling and if she knew who his parents were, then so did the pervert. Naruto took out his life-size paper match doll of himself, one he had made several years ago when he was younger so that if anyone tried to sneak into his apartment when he was sleeping, to attack him, he would replace himself with it, and snuck out a secret hatch that he had made under his bed so that he could make a quick escape from apartment without anyone noticing. After he was out, he stealthily headed for the Hokage Tower, they might have sealed up his chakra but he was still an expert at infiltration and stealth, after all, how else does a kid wearing bright orange, sneak into the Hokage's tower and steal a scroll of forbidden jutsu? Two hours later in the Hokage tower for the past hour Naruto had been looking through the Hokage office searching for information about his parents, he had finally found a hidden compartment in the Hokage's desk, Naruto then spent the next half hour trying to pick the combination lock on the drawer, 
Eventually he cracked the code, the date Konoha was founded, in the compartment were several scrolls and documents. When Naruto finished reading the document concerning his parents, he was so pissed he literally had to bite down on his tongue to keep himself from screaming in rage. They lied to me, Aero Senen, Ba Chan and the old man, they all lied, right to my face, I am the son of the fucking Yandaimi Hokage and they lied to me and stopped me from getting what was rightfully mine, Naruto furiously thought. He had seen the bank accounts in the documents, they showed that his family was among the three wealthiest families in Konoha. Wealthier that those bastards Asai and Amako combined, not counting the money that he got from his mother who was the heiress of the fucking Uzumaki clan of Uzushiogakure, hidden among the whirling tides, which had collapsed right after the second great shinobi war, the two family fortunes combined made him on equal standing in wealth with Gado, had he been still alive, making Naruto one of the wealthiest people in the whole goddamn elemental continent. Naruto was absolutely livid, he had to scrimp and save every day of his life with the little amount of social welfare from the village, and all this time he had a fortune that was rightfully his, the village kept his inheritance from him, they even had the audacity to deny him the knowledge of his family, his family name, and to add insult to injury, they dumped him in some crappy apartment when he had a large estate behind the village. But the things that pissed him off most were one, his own father had been the one to put the Kyubi into him and give him a miserable life, and two, that damn pervert Jiraiya was his fucking godfather and was supposed to take care of him or at the least look out for him, which he didn't. Naruto then decided to open a scroll where he found a letter from his father the Yandaimi, and from the way it was written with messy handwriting you could tell, this letter was written quickly, right before he sealed the Kyubi into him. Dear Naruto, if you were reading this, then Serutobi has deemed you ready to know the truth, you are my son, the son of the Yandaimi Hokage. As I write this letter, the battle against the Kyubi is raging on so I don't have much time to write, I know I will not return alive from this fight, your mother's name was Uzumaki Namikaze Kashina my wife who sadly died giving birth to you, due to a complication that happened. Know that both your mother and I loved you from the moment you came into this world and my only regret is that your mother and I will not be there to watch you grow up, both of us leave you everything we own in this world. You also must know by now that I sealed the Kyubi into you. Hopefully the village will have listened to my last wish and treated you as the hero that you are and that you've had a good life so far, but if my worst fear has come true and the villagers did not follow my wishes, and treated you like an outcast, then I am truly sorry my son for any pain that you went through. I hope you can understand that I picked you to be the container of the Kyubi for I could not go to another family and ask them to make such a sacrifice. The other reason why I made you the container of the Kyubi was in the hope that you would use the power of the Kyubi to become the guardian protector of the village, maybe even come to love it as much as I did, and also protect it from forces like the Uchiha Madara, one of the founders of Konoha, he is the one who fought against the Shodem Hokage long ago and had the power to summon and control the Kyubi, he is the one who summoned Kyubi here to Konoha. My time is now up. Know that if you hate me for what I did to you my son, I do not blame you, but know that I do love you and will never stop loving you, I wish you a long and happy life. Sincerely, your father Namikaze Minato well father it seems that the village let you down, they treated me worse than any outcast, they treated me like the plague and I had to pay the price for your idealism and inability to face reality, Naruto muttered angrily. He placed his father's letter down and opened up the other scroll, there was another letter from his mother, after he finished reading the letter he had small tears falling from his eyes. I swear mother I will not let you down, I will make you proud and I will restore our family's legacy, Naruto swore. Naruto quickly resealed the letters in the scrolls and everything back in the compartment, since these were just copies, according to his mother's letter, the originals were at his family estate, not to mention several other important scrolls his mother had told him about. 20 minutes later at the Namikaze estate when Naruto arrived at the estate he could not believe that he owned this place, it was an enormous mansion four stories high with wide open gardens, and it looked like it could easily house up to 200 people. I own all this and yet Konoha places me in a one-roomed run-down, cockroach-infested shithole, Naruto thought bitterly. Naruto quickly cut his finger kanai and spread his blood on the seal of the gate to open it, when the gate opened he walked into the courtyard and entered the estate, he came to a huge hallway and swiftly searched for the library in the desk his mother mentioned, he soon found a locked door with another seal on it, after spreading more blood he found a massive room filled with scrolls of different things but he did not spend long looking at them. He promptly went to the desk and opened up one of the drawers where he then spread more blood on a seal and a secret compartment revealed itself, 
he found the eight scrolls mentioned in the letter. After retrieving the scrolls, Naruto decided to take at least a few more scrolls that may be useful to him later on. He took several on Taijutsu, a few on Kenjutsu and Sealing since he figured if he was unable to use Chakra, he should probably find another way to defend himself. After grabbing the scrolls Naruto resealed the library door and resealed the main gate, so no one can access the estate until he returned, and he vowed he would reclaim what is rightfully his no matter what. Back at Naruto's apartment it did not take long for Naruto to sneak back into his apartment, he decided to leave now instead of giving those bastards in the council the pleasure of throwing him out themselves. He grabbed his backpack as well as a few other things but before he went through the hatch door, he wrote a quick message on a piece of paper and left it on his kitchen table for anyone to find it. Had Naruto stayed two minutes longer he would have met a late night visitor. In the Hyuga compound 40 minutes ago currently the young Hyuga heiress Hyuga Hanada was crying her heart out over what happened, in the past three days she learned that her crush Naruto had been banished by the council because they believed him to be a threat for some unknown reason, and the worst thing was that her own father had been the deciding vote to send Naruto off. When her father told her this, she couldn't believe it, the only explanation he gave her was, Naruto is threat to the village's safety and she will soon learn the truth, he also stated that it would be best to forget about him and focus on her Jukin and becoming clan head, least she wished to become a branch member. To be honest Hanada didn't care about being clan head or becoming a branch member, all she wanted was for Naruto to be allowed to stay in the village, it hurt her even more that her father forbade her from saying goodbye. Earlier she had asked Kuranai sensei to give him the bento she made for him, when Hanada's sobs dissolved, she looked outside into the night sky, she knew what to do. No more crying, I have to be strong. If this village is going to force Naruto-kun out I am not going to let him go until I tell him how I feel about him, this is maybe the last chance I have thought Hanada. Silently, Hanada sneaked out of the compound and headed towards Naruto's apartment. Naruto's apartment when Hanada arrived she knocked on the door and waited for a few minutes. When she received no answer she knocked several times more. When she still got no answer she activated her Byakugan to see if he was in. When she saw Naruto sleeping in his bed, she was about to deactivate her Byakugan and knock again, but then she realized that the Naruto in bed had no chakra pathways, she frantically broke down the door fearing the worst, when she reached Naruto in bed she found it was just a doll made out of paper mash. Hanada started to look around for any trace of him and found the note that Naruto left, when she read it she collapsed to the ground and started to cry again. Sake all night sake bar 20 minutes earlier sitting by herself in the corner of the sake bar was Tsunade, surrounded by at least 15 empty sake bottles, she had been here for at least 5 hours drinking her sorrow away over the banishment of her surrogate little brother. Bartender another bottle of sake, slurred Tsunade. The bartender was about to get her another bottle when someone else spoke up. No, she's had enough, so don't bother, said the person. When Tsunade turned to see who had kept her from having another drink she frowned. What do you want now Shizune? Can't you let me drown out my sorrows? Cried Tsunade. No, we've been through this with Uncle Dan and your brother for far too long, I won't let you start again with Naruto answered Shizune. She then went over to Tsunade and lifted her out of the chair. She carried her out to the night and started walking down the street. As they walked Shizune said, come on, a bit of walking in the night air will clear your head a bit so that you can see how selfish you're being. What the fuck do you mean by that? Tsunade irritated at her apprentice. At this Shizune then did the unimaginable, she slapped Tsunade across the face with all the strength she could muster, the loud smacking sound that could be clearly heard in the empty street. When Tsunade turned her head back to face Shizune, she put her hand to her reddened cheek, a look of complete shock covered her face, she never expected Shizune to do something like this, before Tsunade could come to her senses Shizune started to speak. Look at you, leader of the strongest military power in the elemental nations, and you're here? Drinking your pain and feeling sorry for yourself, you did everything you could to put a stop to Naruto's banishment, and yet you have not even once gone see him, you know in the morning he will be leaving the village for good, have you even thought about how Naruto might feel right now, after everything that he has gone through? He stayed, growing up in this village with all the abuse and hardship, just so that he could one day become a ninja and then accomplish his dream of becoming Hokage, all of which has now been stolen from him, he's being kicked out of the only home he's ever known, and once he leaves he will be hunted by the Akatsuki, who will not stop until they extract the Kyubi from him and kill him, so stop being so selfish and start thinking about someone else for a change. 
Naruto right now is alone and is hurting, and he needs all the people he cares about around him to help him through this, now are you going to go to him or are you going back to that bar again and try and drink you problems away again? Shizune ranted. Tsunade just stood there still holding her red cheek, she could not move after letting Shizune rant, after a minute or two she collapsed on the ground and started to cry. Shizune's words had finally sunken in and had hurt more than a punch in the gut or a kanai stab ever could. I I I, it just that I MSS so tired of TT the village TTT taking so mm many of the people I care about from me. First my grandfather, TTT, then my uncle, my BB brother, then Dan Kun and then Serutobi SS sensei and now Naruto. Why does this village keep taking away the people I care most about? Sobbed Tsunade. I know it hard Tsunade sama but drinking your problems away like this won't solve anything, nor will feeling sorry for yourself. Shizun helped her sensei up and said, now let's go to Naruto, I am sure he could do with someone coming to talk to him and be with him right now. Tsunade just nodded her head in agreement and once she was on her feet the two of them headed for Naruto's apartment. As they walked Tsunade suddenly said, thanks Shizun I needed someone to smack some sense into me. Anytime Tsunade sama, I did enjoy smacking you though, said Shizun with a smirk. I bet you did after all the trouble I caused you over the years, I am glad that you are still with me, replied Tsunade with a small smile. Always Tsunade sama, always, said Shizun with her own smile. Naruto's apartment When they reached the apartment they saw that the door had been broken and heard someone rushed in and turned on the lights, and saw Hanada on the floor next to the small kitchen table bawling her eyes out, they also saw the lifelike paper match Naruto on the floor next to Naruto's bed. Tsunade quickly went on her knees and went to the crying young girl. Hanada what's wrong? Where's Naruto? Aksa worried Tsunade. But Hanada just grabbed onto Tsunade's robe and put her head into her chest and cry harder. Tsunade tried to calm the girl until she noticed a crumpled piece of paper on the floor that Hanada must have been holding, when she picked it up and read it, Tsunade's own eyes started to tear up and she too started to cry, holding onto Hanada for her comfort. Shizun went over to the two weeping women and picked up the piece of paper that Tsunade had dropped. Oh Naruto she thought sadly about the poor boy that she viewed as a younger brother, she felt like crying with Hanada and Tsunade, but she knew she could do that later, now was not the time. Suddenly the Anbu squad that had been assigned to watch over Naruto appeared. The squad had seen the young girl come to the Uzumaki apartment and knock on the apartment door. They knew that the young girl had feelings for the boy, all the different Anbu squads had seen the girl spy on Naruto at one point or other, it became a common joke about how the boy was so blind to the girl's feelings towards him and how the girl would faint whenever she tried to talk to him, hell, some even had betting pool running as to when she would finally pluck up the courage to tell him how she felt or if Naruto would ever notice. The Anbu division had been informed of Naruto's banishment due to it dealing with the village security. But had been sworn to not inform anyone until Naruto left the village, like most of the Anbu division the squad disagreed with the council's decision since they knew he wasn't the Kyubi, and knew enough about sealing to understand the level of intricacy and skill that was involved in the Yandaimi's seal, this same Anbu squad, had kept watch on him long enough to know he was simply a young boy with a hard burden on his shoulders. When they saw the girl break into Naruto apartment they grew concerned especially when they heard the girl crying a minute later, the squad had been about to go and see what had happened, but when they saw the Hokage and Shizune arrive, they waited, a minute or so after the Hokage and Shizune entered Naruto apartment they heard more crying, or to be more precise the Hokage crying with Hanada, when they heard this, the squad decided to investigate. Shizun san what has happened? Why are the Hokage and Hanada san crying and where is Uzumaki san? asked the leader of the Anbu squad that wore a bare Anbu mask. Shizun answered, Naruto is gone. The Anbu captain could not mask the surprise in his voice, but how? My squad and I have been watching his apartment the entire time, we never saw him leave, we even checked on him an hour ago when we looked through his window and saw him asleep in his bed. You most likely saw that in his bed, answered Shizun, pointing at the life-size paper match Naruto on the floor. Plus, Naruto probably has a secret escape hatch or something in here, just in case, since I am sure you all know how resourceful he can be, said Shizun. All four Anbu nodded in agreement, do you wish for us to look for him and try and find him? asked the Anbu captain. Why bother? Naruto is probably long gone by now, he is going to be banished tomorrow anyway, why not let him get a head start? Even if you bring him back, 
the council is just going to make a spectacle of him tomorrow in front of the village and I for one do not want to see that said Shizun. The Anbu nodded, not wanting to see something like that either. You can all go now, Shizun ordered, the squad said hi, and left. As they did, Shizun could not help but look up to the night sky wondering where Naruto was right now. Please be safe Naruto, Shizun thought, then went over to the two weeping women and tried to comfort them, as she did so she placed the note that Naruto had left back on the kitchen table, there was only one word written on it. Goodbye, outside Konoha, on a hill overlooking the village, a lone figure stood looking down at it for the last time. My old life in Konoha is over, and a new one will begin outside it, but just you wait, Konoha. I vow, in the name of my mother Uzumaki Kashina, it'll become strong, it'll become stronger than my father or anyone else has ever been and when I do, you'll be sorry that you ever banished me, that is a promise of a lifetime, believe it, thought Naruto before turned his back on the village walk away into the night. Some time later, it had been a while since Naruto left Konoha. He had taken off in a random direction, not really caring where he was going. His had wanted to go to Suna, but that would cause problems for Gara. he wasn't even sure if he would be welcome there, since he was one of the reasons why the invasion failed, though Suna had been tricked into it they still suffered a heavy loss and a humiliating defeat, not to mention he would bring the Akatsuki to their doorsteps, sure Gara was a Jinshuriki like him, but Gara could at least defend himself and his village, as it was surrounded by sand. Naruto on the other hand couldn't use chakra and would only make things harder on Gara. he didn't want to do that to his friend. He didn't want to go to Taki or to his friend Shibuki the leader of Taki, and cause trouble for him, since like Suna, Taki's alliance with Konoha would be very important to them. Naruto had also thought about going to Haru, Yuki no Kuni, Spring, Snow Country, since he was sure that Lady Koyuki would welcome him, but he knew that Haru, Yuki no Kuni was very far away and he would definitely not get there by foot, not only that, he didn't have enough money to get there by ship, he also knew that at some point the Akatsuki would find him there and would attack him, as a result putting Lady Koyuki and her people in danger. Wave might have been a good choice, or even the Land of Tea, working with the Wagarashi clan, but Naruto knew that eventually the Akatsuki would find him in either places and he would not put Wave in danger because of him, he also knew that the Wagarashi clan would stand no chance if they went up against anyone of the Akatsuki. All things linked up to the same thing, the Akatsuki would at some point find him and hunt him down, hurting the people he cared about in the process. He thought about going to another ninja village that had no alliance or real link or connection to Konoha that could maybe get these seals off him and maybe even protect him in some way if he agreed to be one of their ninjas, but he realized that even if he found a village that could help him and allow him to join, the choices weren't that great, Aim, Kusa and Hoshi were small villages and not very strong. He knew he needed to be with one of the five great shinobi villages to stand a chance of surviving an attack from the Akatsuki. Kiri was out of the question since he had heard when he met Haku that they were in the middle of a civil war, plus after he heard how people with bloodlines were treated there, he wanted no part of that, Iwa was also out of the question since the moment they looked at him or found out where he was from or even worse found out who his parents were, he would be killed on the spot. The final choice was Kumo, but Naruto didn't want to go there. Since he didn't know much about the village, other than what Neji had told him about how they attempted to kidnap Hinata. He also heard that Kumo tried to kidnap her again during the Suna and Otto invasion, which was prevented by Neji and his team. Needless to say, Naruto did not have a very high opinion of that village. This left him only one choice, to wander around on his own trying to find a way to get these seals off him himself and keep on training with the scrolls he had took from his family home. Naruto was in a dense forest in the middle of a heavy rainstorm trying to find some shelter, he was unsure of where exactly though, he had run out of food several days ago, he had tried hunting but had no luck, he didn't go to town, for fear of being spotted or recognized from any chance meetings with Akatsuki, are their agents. Soon enough though, Naruto collapsed on the wet ground, weak from tiredness and hunger. So this is how it's all going to end, not the way I had wanted, but it could be worse, Naruto thought sadly as he was about to drift into unconsciousness, until he forced himself to wake up no. I still have my goal to accomplish. I can't give up, I won't give up. Naruto thought as he tried to get up but fell back on the ground. As he was drifting in and out of unconsciousness he heard the chiming of small bells, when he glanced up, he saw two figures strolling towards him, even though it was dark he could make out two very important facts, 
both of them were wearing conical straw hats with small spike-like balls hanging down to cover their faces and both were wearing dark cloaks, with chin-high collars that covered their faces. One word popped into his mind as he fell into unconsciousness. Akatsuki, they had found him, a n well that's the end of my first chapter for my first story, please tell me what you think of it good or bad. Please review, I like to hear what you think, I don't mind too much, I even welcome some helpful criticism for this story. Also I should say any flames will be ignored, if you have nothing but bad things to say about my story then please kept them to yourself and stop reading then since I never forced you to read my story. I have been tinkering with this story for a year or two and just so you know there will be one or two things that will not follow the manga since the things that I planned were done before certain things came to the manga and can't be changed for the story. Please read and review this story I will try and have the next update as soon as I can. Also just to get this nitbit out of the way I do not own Naruto whatsoever or any of the characters from it if I did I would have had Naruto kill Pain in a big battle in a blaze of glory and have Naruto kill Sasuke. The bastard is a traitor pure and simple, as I am getting really sick of Naruto and the other trying to save Sasuke, he's clearly does not want to be saved and wants to destroy Konoha so they should just kill him already so to stop the trouble he causing and be finally rid of him. Currently in the middle of the sea that separated Cha no Kuni, tea country, from the islands of Nagi and Uzu, a single royal ship belonging to the daimyo of Umi no Kuni, sea country, was sailing on its way to Tsuki no Kuni, moon country. On board the ship was the daimyo of Umi no Kuni, the only daughter Princess Saki. The princess was extremely beautiful although she did not wear expensive clothes. Jewelry, or makeup like most princesses, instead, she wore a simple, yet elegant purple kimono with red slash around her waist. She was slimly built and had long, silky raven black hair that reached down to her lower thigh, bright sky blue eyes and had an angelic-like face, her beauty had often won the attention of many different suitors from her own country as well as from others but the princess had shown no interest with any of them. Another thing about the princess was that, unlike most princesses, she did not spend her time going to parties and looking nice just to attract suitable husbands. She preferred to spend her time learning, she enjoyed reading poetry writing, singing songs, and reading books as well as playing with children. She wanted to learn as much as she could so if needed be. She would be able to help rule her country, she was passionate for the peace and prosperity of her country. Even though she was not the next ruler of Umi no Kuni, her older brother Tachihiko was, she wanted to at least contribute a bit, she did not like fighting and believed that force should only be an absolute last resort once all options for peace talks and communications have ended and there is no other choice. The princess was also a very skilled diplomat and had helped her father on several occasions during talks with other countries in terms of trade rights and other things. She was a very gifted speaker due to her passions to help people who needed it. The reason why the princess was heading to Tsuki no Kuni was because she was engaged to the crown prince of Tsuki no Kuni. Prince Tsuki Hikaru heir to the throne of Tsuki no Kuni. Both the prince and the princess had met often over the years and had been friends for many of those years since both Tsuki no Kuni and Umi no Kuni were strong allies with one another. Hikaru's grandfather, the previous king of Tsuki no Kuni, his son Tsuki Kakeru current king of Tsuki no Kuni, as well as Hikaru himself had often visited Umi no Kuni when Hikaru's grandfather had business with the Umi daimyo over ships, trade issues, or other political matters, Saki, Tachihiko, and their father in turn, would accompany the delegations to Tsuki no Kuni often, they would also come and visit just for a vacation, since Tsuki no Kuni was famed for being an excellent country for people on holidays. Over time, both Saki and Hikaru had grown close with one another, often wrote letters to each other, it had been obvious that the two were falling in love. Whenever they were at the same parties both could be usually found talking to one another or even dancing together. Eventually, Saki's father told her and Hikaru that, at some point when the children were each 10 years old, Hikaru's grandfather, Tsuki Kakeru, suggested an arranged marriage between the two since he believed that Saki would be an excellent wife for his grandson and would help him rule wisely over the people of Tsuki no Kuni. Further, such a marriage would make the alliance between their two countries even stronger, Saki's father had agreed to this so long as, when the two were of marrying age, they agreed to the conditions also, Hikaru's grandfather, Tsuki Kakeru, had agreed and both men signed a contract stating the agreement between the two rulers, when both the prince and princess saw the contracted between Saki's father and Hikaru's grandfather, both agreed to the contract. The wedding was to be held in Tsuki no Kuni, 
Saki would have to be in Tasuki no Kuni two months before the wedding so that she could help prepare for the ceremony and prepare herself for the duties that she would take as the future queen of Tasuki no Kuni. Saki's father, along with her brother Tachihiko, would come later on for the wedding itself to give her away. When she was leaving, Saki's father had originally wanted her to have an entire fleet as well as 1,000 royal guards to protect her on her way to Tasuki no Kuni, but she had battered her father down to one ship, 20 royal guards, and a squad of ninjas to protect her since she did not want so many men around her all the time. Saki's father had hired a squad of Konoha ninjas to guard her. Although Hikaru had offered to send some ninjas from the newly founded Shinobi village Tasuki no Kuni the Getsugakir no Sado, the village hidden under in the moon, or hire ninjas from other villages. Such as Kumogakir no Sado, the village hidden in the clouds, are the newly formed Heavenly Alliance, whom Tasuki no Kuni had been allied with the past two years, they were politely refused, Saki's father had insisted that he use the ninja from Konoha since he had held them in high regard ever since a ninja from that village had saved his life many years back. As the ship sailed, the princess could be seen on deck seated down on a small stool reading a book to pass the time, at times, she would also watch some of the ninjas from the Konoha team spar with one another to pass the time, as time passed, the princess could not help but think that the trip was becoming quite uneventful, believing noting would happen. Oh how wrong she was, on the bow of the ship currently standing at the bow of the ship looking forward was a tall, attractive raven-haired woman with bright crimson red eyes. She wore a single red sleeve and white patterned bandages with a ninja fishnet shirt underneath it. This woman was none other than Yuhi Serutobi Kuranai, Konoha's famed Genjutsu mistress, and was the team leader of this mission. Which was of vital importance to Konoha since the village had been on some hard times of late and was in growing danger from its enemies. The marriage between the princess of Umi no Kuni and the prince Tasuki no Kuni would strengthen the already strong trade alliance between Umi no Kuni and Tasuki no Kuni and if they successfully accomplish this mission, it would put Konoha in good favor with both countries, this would then allow Konoha to negotiate for a trade treaty with them since the trade alliance between Umi no Kuni and Tasuki no Kuni controlled all trade in the southern part of the elemental sea, author note don't know if this is what the sea is called in Naruto so I just calling it that. Also, if Konoha was able to get a trade treaty with them, it would give Konoha a new, much needed source of trade and missions, not to mention it could lead to a possible alliance between the newly founded Tsukigakir no Sato and Tasuki no Kuni, as Konoha currently needed all the allies they could possibly get. As Kuranai looked out to the endless horizon of the sea she could not help but think of all the things that happened in the past ten years, so much had happened and so much had changed over this period of time, and it all started when the Konoha council had banished a certain blonde ninja. When news of Naruto's leaving the village the night before he would be officially banished from the village, caused many on the civilian part of the council to cause a fuss. They had wanted to make a spectacle out of him in front of the whole village when he was officially banished. Although the other members that had voted for Naruto to be banished did not care since. As long as he was gone, they did not care how he left. Soon after, the council then released the news that, now that Naruto was no longer a ninja or a citizen of Konoha. The law that the Sandame Hokage made about Naruto was annulled. Now all the younger generations now knew that Naruto was a Jinchuriki for the Kayubi. The news had received a mixed response among the younger generation. Many had followed their parents' path and viewed Naruto as the Kayubi in human form, others, who had at least known Naruto in some way, did not share the older generation's view of him and just saw him as a person who got a raw deal from the village, others still did not know what to think of him since they had seen the boy many times and, other than doing pranks, he had done noting wrong but yet he held the Kayubi inside him the demon that had nearly destroyed their village. The news, of course, had the biggest effect on the members of the former Konoha 12. After hearing the news, Shino had stated that he had found a new form of respect for Naruto considering the burden he held, plus, he too knew what it was like to be the living host of another being. Neji himself had said that he respected Naruto even more now, for the burden that he carried was one heavier than the one he himself carried and, in some small way, understood what Naruto went through the burden to carry a curse seal. When Lee had heard the news he had started shouting about how bright Naruto's flames of youth were to carry and contain such a burden like the Kyubi in him and still smile all the time, he had also stated that he would work even harder now just so that his own flames of youth could match Naruto's. As Kurenai thought of that she could not help but chuckle at that memory of Lee, 
since he always was able to brighten people mood much like Naruto used to do. When Hanada heard the truth about Naruto, she had cried harder than she ever had. Only now knowing how much Naruto must have gone through in his life carrying his burden and never once had she tried to help him. She had cried most of the day after Naruto left, since she had been the first one to find out that Naruto had left the village before she could say goodbye to him, she had also confessed in private to Kurenai that she had gone over to Naruto's apartment to tell him how she felt about him, only to find that he had left. When Hanada told Kurenai this, Kurenai felt her heart go out to the poor girl as she could only imagine what the girl was going through at the time. Even with the news of Naruto being a Jinchuriki, the opinion of Naruto to most of the other members of the Konoha 12 did not change, they all considered him their friend, the same was said by Konohamaru and his friends. The only members of the Konoha 12 that had anything bad to say about Naruto were Ino, much to her father's disappointment, and Sakura. They had taken the view of believing that Naruto was a demon. While Sasuke boasted when he heard the news that he knew that the dope couldn't have beaten him without some help and saying that if it wasn't for the Kyubi's chakra Naruto would never have beaten him, to which Shikamaru had put him down a peg or two by telling him it still didn't change the fact that Naruto still defeated him and it wasn't any different than when Sasuke had used the power of the curse seal that he got from Orochimaru. This, of course, shut up the boy for a while. When the news of Naruto's banishment had been released to the civilian and ninja population there had been a great deal of celebration by the civilians and many ninja, mainly Chunin and a few Jonin level ninja, but that had been quickly put down by Suande. Having many of them arrested and put in holding cell for a few days for disturbing the peace. When the civilian council tried to object to Suin's actions trying to stop the celebration of Naruto banishment, Suande quickly put them down stating that they were still under a state of emergency and that there were to be no celebration at any time until the state of emergency had ended, the civilian council could do nothing about this since Suande was well in her rights to do so during such times. Not long after the news of Naruto's banishment and being a Jinchuriki came out, Konoha fell under attack by a series of daily pranks at the hands of Konohamaru and his friends. These pranks lasted an entire year before Konohamaru and his team graduated from the academy. The pranks were often and always varied, the pranks ranged from having sticky flower bombs exploding in clothes stores, stink bombs exploding in food stores, and sticky bubblegum bombs exploding in the several different shops and on people. A large number of cockroaches were also let loose in a restaurant and all the Inazuka's kennels were opened and their dogs released. That is, after spraying several people with dog pheromone, let's not forget the paint bombs exploding in certain people's homes, one of the worst pranks was when, at some point, the civilians tried to celebrate Naruto banishment, Konohamaru and his team built a catapult and used old dirty baby diapers from the baby's ward in the hospital as ammo, needless to say, the celebrations did not last long and many people had to go home and scrub themselves down hard. Most of these pranks were aimed at the civilian population as well as others who had either been cruel to Naruto in some way or another, a lot of Konohamaru's pranks had also been aimed at the council members that had banished Naruto. Kurenai could not help but smile when she remembered all the pranks that Konohamaru and his team had done. Some being with council member Kaharu, who had been legged fucked by two Inazuka dogs, one at each leg, and had to try and walk to the hospital as they were doing her. It had taken most of the day trying to get the dogs off her. Another prank was when Udon had somehow set off a stink bomb in the council room while it was in session. It had taken several days before the smell in the council room had cleared enough for it to be used again. Moegi achieved something special when she had switched Sakura's shampoo with instant. Quick drying glue when she was in the Kunoichi shower room. The girl's hands were stuck to her head and, to further humiliate her, Moegi had tricked her into walking out to the street naked where she had to run all the way home in her birthday suit, in the end, Sakura's mother had to cut off several large bits of her hair to get her hands free which resulted with Sakura having several bald parts on her head and her hands now had a light pink coating, needless to say, Sakura had not been seen by anyone for a few weeks. Konohamaru and his team had even somehow gotten the Chunin's Azumo and Kotetsu to help them in their pranks where later on Kuriani found out that they had been friends with Naruto and loved his pranks. With the two Chunin's help, they set up a bubblegum bomb in council member Hojo Akira's office, when he entered, it blew up causing Akira to be stuck to his office wall, it wasn't until the next day that they were finally able to get him off the wall but they had to shave his head bald since his hair was completely covered in bubblegum, not to mention he was covered in sore marks and scratches from the bubblegum being pulled off him. 
The next person to be hit had been Kakashi, Azumo and Kotetsu had told him of an excellent bar called the Blue Oyster that they had found in the village and that it served top-notch sake for cheap prices. When Kakashi went to it he found out that it was gay bar and, what was worse, the night he went was when the Hitaki Kakashi fanboy club was having their annual meeting, needless to say, Kakashi's girly screams were heard all over the village for the early part of the night, when they had finally caught him, the fanboy club had spent the rest of the night dancing the tango dance with Kakashi. They even had all taken turns to dance with the copycat ninja, to add insult to injury, Azumo and Kotetsu had somehow gotten photos of Kakashi's dances with each of the members of his fanboy club and made copies of them all and posted them all over the village for everyone to see, this even also got the attention of many yaoi fangirls, needless to say Kakashi found it very hard to walk down the street with certain men and women eyeing him in a way that freaked him out. Thinking of that time caused Kuranai to chuckle at Kakashi's suffering since, in her mind he deserved it. Another council member that had been targeted was Ashikaga Shin. He had several skunks secretly placed inside his briefcase and when he opened it. Well needless to say no one was willing to do business with him or even to stay with him in the same room for a week or two. That is, everyone except for the ramen chief Tenchi who, one day, saw Shin and punched him in the nose, breaking it along with giving him two matching black eyes. Ino was then later hit by pranksters where they secretly switched her bubble bath liquid with green dye so that when she looked at herself in the mirror the whole village heard her reaction. It had taken three weeks before the dye finally wore off her, the running joke during this time that many of the Konoha 12 members repeated was that she would at least match the gardens and flowers in her family store, not only that, it would also improve her stealth skills in the forest, these jokes had infuriated the young girl to no end as they happened daily and often. Sasuke was yet another person to suffer from the unending pranks. The youngsters had slipped a sleeping pill in his food at some point and somehow, in a single night, painted Sasuke's entire house pink. Both inside and out as well as the floor and roof, they had even filled the rooms with various women's sex toys that would also be used by certain types of men as well as many frilly things. They even went so far as to dye his hair pink as he slept and threw out all his normal clothes and replaced them with tight-fitting shirts that said Gay Uchiha's rule. I love to fuck men or kiss me I am gay. They also put in tight-fitting hot pants and his underwear had been switched with pink frilly girly underwear with pictures of hearts and teddy bears. They even went so far as to put in some clothes that were pink versions of Lee jumpsuit. The next morning everyone heard the Uchiha's cries of rage and horror and had seen the young Uchiha walking around the streets wearing a pink shirt that said gay Uchiha's rule a pair of hot pants where people saw a bit of the frilly underwear with hearts sticking out a bit of the hot pants as well as his new hair color as he walked around the village ordering new clothes and having his home refurbished which altogether took several days. Also during that time, the young Uchiha heir had gained a great deal more attention from his fanboy club, much to his annoyance where many were sending letters of proposals of marriage to him and undying love as well as several pictures of them in various outfits much to the young Uchiha horror. The Karama clan had their clan compound TPED by the Konohamaru gang at one night where toilet roll could be found all over the place on every home in the compound. Council member Asai Haida was then hit later on by Konohamaru and his friends and their Chunin allies where they infested Haida's new family home with dozens of rats and mice and hundreds of cockroaches termites, spiders and other various creepy crawlies. By the time Haida realized that his home had been infested by these creatures they were all over his house. It cost Haida a fortune to get rid of all the insects and vermin considering the fact that more had gotten in in the mansion and their population was so large that it took months to get the job done. He had to wait even longer since the termites and the other vermin had done a lot of damage to the interlayer of the mansion resulting in the mansion being condemned and then completely refurbished from top to bottom. He even had to buy all new furniture since the vermin had ruined it all. Altogether, the entire ordeal had cost Haida a very sizable amount of his money where. From what Kuranai had heard, he had cried like a baby when he found out how much money it would cost him. Haida was not the only one to suffer from a lose of a get deal of money. Because of Konoha pranksters, Konohamaru and the others had somehow gathered an army of over a thousand hungry rabbits, to which to this day no one had figured out how they gathered all the rabbits, and let them lose on Imako Taichi's fields and crops. The rabbits practically ate all of Taichi's crops costing him an entire year's worth of profits and it had cost his a very pretty penny to get rid of all the rabbits and replant all the crops, later on it was said that he had thrown quite a hissy fit over it all. 
The Hyuga clan was soon hit afterwards with probably the biggest prank ever played in Konoha. Somehow, Konohamaru had broken into the Hyuga compound and stolen all the Hyuga clan's underwear. From boxers and briefs to bras, knickers and thongs. And proceeded to hang them up all over the village from trees to flag poles and from rooftops to the middle of the street. Kuranai did not think it was possible for any Hyuga, other than Hanada, to blush as much from embarrassment but on that day she had been proven wrong when the entire Hyuga clan had to go around the whole village. Picking up their unmentionables in front of everyone. Many of the Hyuga clan members had blushes on their faces that rivaled Hanada's as they picked up their various things. Hiyashi himself had to go up to the tallest flagpost atop of the Hokage Tower to get his boxers down that were flying on the flagpost like flags for all the village to see. As he did so, the Hyuga clan head's face was so red from embarrassment and rage that it put any color that Hanada had ever show to shame. The only Hyugas that had not been hit by Konohamaru's prank were Neji, Hanada, and Hanada's younger sister Hanabi. Kuranai could not keep herself from laughing at the prank on the Hyuga clan that day. Since they had been made the laughing stock of the entire village Asuma had even told her that during several council meetings soon could not look at Hiyashi without busting out laughing while the other clan heads snickered and laughed at the Hyuga clan, even the stoic Shibi and the silent Anbu commander were heard chuckling at Hiyashi's humiliation, Kuriani remembered when she and Asuma asked Konohamaru how he did it. The young boy had just smiled and said a true prankster never reveals his secrets. About a month after Naruto banishment Uchiha Sasuke had his trial for trying to leave the village to join one of Konoha's mortal enemies. The snake Sanin Orochimaru, during the trial, the civilian council members hired the top litigators in Konoha to defend the Uchiha's case. They had stated that Sasuke's judgment was impaired when he left the village due to the fact of the mental trauma that he suffered when the Uchiha clan had been massacred combined with the effect that the curse seal that Orochimaru put on him. Hence, Sasuke could not be held responsible for his actions at the time since it had been proven that the curse seal can affect a person's mind or judgment at times. The example being Anko with her memory loss and his teammate Haruno Sakura reports that Sasuke was not himself when he first used the curse seal when he had awakened from his battle with Orochimaru in the Forest of Death. Although some did argue that, if the Uchiha's mental state was in question then he should no longer be a ninja. The litigators countered by stating that Jiraiya had sealed up the curse seal himself when Sasuke was returned to the village and there was no danger of Sasuke leaving. They also argued that Konoha could not afford to be seen weak now since it had not been long after the invasion of Suna and Otto and Konoha needed the Uchiha clan so they could still be seen as being strong. No one could really argue against that statement, altogether. The trial had been a complete farce as far as many ninjas saw it since it was clear that the civilians were on the Uchiha's side and if he had been properly punished like he should have been, the civilian would cause havoc over him and would riot over him. Weakling Konoha further, it was soon decided that Sasuke would not be executed or sent to prison for trying to defect from the village and he would be allowed to stay a ninja. However, he would not be allowed to be promoted for three years. He would also have a tracking seal put on him by Jiraiya once he returned to the village and until said time. He would be under house arrest and would have Anbu watching him at all times until he had proven himself to be a loyal ninja. He was also not allowed to leave the village by himself under any condition and if he did have to leave, he would have to be accompanied by one. Two or three Jonin ninjas, further, he was also forbidden from using the curse seal no matter what the situation and if he did he would be killed on the spot without trial. When the civilian's council members heard the last ruling they tried to object but Suande had shot them down. Since Sasuke was a ninja of Konoha again and was under her ruling and he had to be punished for trying to leave the village no matter what his excuse was. The civilian's council members knew that they could not fight the last ruling since it was within her power to do so. Plus Danzo, Kaharu, and Homura were all in agreement with Suande ruling hence without their support the civilian members stood no chance of overruling her. Even with the punishment, many ninja saw this as nothing but a slap on the wrist, and were angered by this, since they knew that they could not get away with what the Uchiha had done and yet he had, although Sasuke himself may have found Tsunade ruling insulting to him and it may have angered him, it did not change the fact to many ninjas that he was getting off far too easily. About three months after Naruto's banishment Jiraiya returned to the village planning to take Naruto on a training trip. At the time he had not known or heard of Naruto's banishment since he had left the village right before the council had banished Naruto. 
But when he did hear of it from Suande he went ballistic and had tried to attack the council members that had Naruto banished. It took Tsunade and over a dozen Anbu members to hold Jiraiya back from killing them. Soon after, they were able to calm Jiraiya down enough so that he would not try and kill the council members. After he had calmed down, Jiraiya had stated that he was going to find Naruto. But the council stopped him stating that they would not allow it. When Jiraiya told them they could not stop him since he was a ninja and answered only to the Hokage. Kaharu had countered by stating that if he went to Naruto he would interfere with their plan to deal with the Akatsuki. And since it was dealing with the safety of the village, they did have the power to order him from going to Naruto. When Jiraiya asked what their plan was she simply gave him the same answer they gave Suande that since he was so emotional attached to Naruto it would risk their operation but they would tell them all when the time was right. When council member Hojo Akira had suggested that Jiraiya train Sasuke, Jiraiya had punched him in the gut and sent him flying across the room saying, you may be able to stop me from finding Naruto, but you will never be able to force me to ever train that traitorous little brat, and then left the room. Kuranai had then later on heard from Shizune that Jiraiya still went and tried to find Naruto through his contacts and sources. As well as through the Toad Summon contract that Jiraiya had allowed Naruto to sign, unfortunately, none of Jiraiya's contacts or sources could find Naruto and the Toad Summons had told him that although they knew Naruto was alive at the time due to the connection he had with the Toad Summons, for some reason they were unable to track him and find where he was or even reverse summon him to them. Four months after Naruto's banishment, the news had speared to other countries, when certain countries and villages heard it they were furious, to say the very least. When Nami no Kuni, Wave Country, learned of Naruto's banishment they were furious beyond words with the hero of their country being banished for something that was not his fault. They then sent a message to Konoha stating that they were annulling the trade treaty that they had recently made. And were ceasing any and all trade with Konoha and that all merchant and transport ships that were controlled by Nami no Kuni would refuse to work or trade with Konoha. Also, any and all mission that Nami no Kuni would have originally given to Konoha would now be given to Suna. This had, of course, caused Konoha a great deal of trouble since Nami no Kuni was strategically positioned for trade with Konoha. The fire country with other important countries, what was worse was. When the tyrant business's Mangato was killed, the people of Nami no Kuni took over his shipping company. Giving them major control over the central elemental sea trading industry. Such a blow would severely hurt Konoha's economic structure. Asuma had told Kuranai that when Ashikaga Shin and Amako Taichi heard Nami no Kuni's message they made perfect imitations of wide-eyed gaping fish. As they realized how much this would hurt their businesses, Konoha had sent three different delegations to try and reopen negotiations with Nami no Kuni. Unfortunately, all three delegations were kicked out as soon as they arrived, the last one was even given a message from the representative of Nami no Kuni Tazuna which said if any Konoha ninja or person ever sent foot here to Nami no Kuni again he or she will be sent back in a box and we will then place a full embargo on your village this, of course, had got the desired effect from Konoha and they had stopped trying. The next country to act was Cha no Kuni, tea country. The leader of the Wasabi clan Jirocho used his influence over the daimyo of Cha no Kuni to send all his missions to Suna instead of Konoha, since Jirocho was said to have had been impressed by the boy when he met him the few times he did, he was very grateful to Naruto for helping to deal with the Wagarashi clan and helping them to win the shrine race, he had also known how important Naruto was to Suande and knew she did not want him to be banished. He had also forbid all trade with Konoha in Digarashi port which was an important trading place for Konoha like with Nami no Kuni, this too had hurt Konoha greatly since Cha no Kuni was a very important client of Konoha's and its loss met losing a lot of valuable missions and money. Another country to react badly to Naruto's banishment was Haru, Yuki no Kuni, Spring, Snow Country. When the lady daimyo Kazahana Koyuki had heard what had happened she had been beyond anger with Konoha. She, herself, went to Konoha along with 200 of her samurai and 12 Yonki ninjas and demanded a meeting with both the Hokage and the council. She ranted for 20 minutes about how furious she was with them at banishing the hero of Yuki no Kuni over their simple hatred of the Kayubi. After which, she informed them that she was annulling Konoha's alliance with both Haru, Yuki no Kuni and Yukigakir no Sado, the village hidden in the snow, which she had allowed to be maintained under the control of a few ninjas that had been loyal to her father before her uncle took control. She also annulled the technology trade agreement with Konoha, 
where Haru, Yuki no Kuni was planning on sharing some of its advanced technology with Konoha, as well as annulling all other trade agreements with them. This had, of course, greatly hurt Konoha since many members of the council, especially members like Danzo and Kaharu, were almost drooling over the ideas of having weapons like chakra armor and the volley guns and using them to strengthen Konoha. The council tired to persuade Lady Koyuki from annulling both the alliances with her country and village and annulling the trade agreements but she would not budge. She even told Jiraiya that she refused to star in the Icha Icha Paradise movie and that she would have some of her friends in the movie industry make sure that it would never be made which caused the super pervert in Kakashi, when he heard, to each have three simultaneous heart attacks, Lady Koyuki soon after left the village, not wanting to stay in it any longer. Soon after that Shibuki, leader of Takigakir no Sado, the village hidden in the waterfall, arrived in the village with two squads of Jonin ninjas demanding a meeting with the Hokage. From what Shizune had told Kurenai, Shibuki had been greatly angered by what Konoha had done simply because Naruto was a Jinchuriki. He had also stated that he had become disgusted at the way they had treated a good friend of his. Especially one that had taught him how to be a real leader for his people. Not to mention that Naruto was a hero to his people. Since he had saved them from the rogue Taki Janin Ninja Suin and his followers from taking over his village and stealing the hero water from them. He also stated that he and his people would never have treated their Jinchuriki Fu like that. Since he stated that his people think Fu as a protector and friend to their village, Shibuki then informed Tsunade that he and the Takigakir Council and the villagers of Takigakir had agreed to annul their alliance between their villages since they wanted no part of Konoha. After saying his piece, he then left, this too, left Konoha in an weakened stated since with the alliance with Taki gone as well as Yuki, that left Tsuna as Konoha's only shinobi ally. Of course soon enough, that too changed, almost a year after Naruto's banishment. Tsuna announced its new case cage, Sabaku no Gara, Gara of the Sand, the Jinchuriki of the Shukaku the Ichibi, the one-tailed beast. When Gara first heard of what had happened he had been so greatly angered by what happened to Naruto that he left the village for the day and unleashed his anger and fury by creating a massive sandstorm that spread out over 20 miles in length from what Kuriani had heard from a few Tsuna ninjas. Gara knew at the time there was not much he could do. But when he became Kei's cage he caused several painful political headaches for Konoha and its council. He, like many others, also took apart the treaty between Konoha piece by piece until the only thing left with the treaty between the two villages where both sides would help each other in a time of war. But only if it affected both villages, even though both Suna and Konoha were still allies, the relationship between the villages was very tense to say the least, especially since Suna was regaining its former strength and received new funding from their daimyo and getting new missions from Cha no Kuni and Nami no Kuni. A year after Naruto had been banished there had still not been any sign of Naruto anywhere, although Jiraiya had still confirmed from the toads that he was still alive somewhere, Kurenai remembered during that time not much had changed in the village, other than when she and Asuma had gotten married, but soon after they had married, news had arrived about Naruto. When finishing a mission, a team of Jonins had found what looked to have been a battle in a clearing of a forest. Trees had fallen and scorch marks were on the ground as well as holes but the most notable things that they found were black flames around the clearing that would not go out even with a water jutsu sprayed on it. And a torn piece of a black cloak with a red clouds on it along with some blood on it and a badly ripped orange jacket. Also covered in a large amount of blood, when the team returned what they found to Tsunade, she immediately had the blood on the cloak and the blood on the jacket compared with certain samples, when the testing was done it had proven everyone's worst fears true. The blood on the cloak was Uchiha Itachi's blood and the blood on the jacket was Naruto's blood, which confirmed that the Akatsuki had captured Naruto. Tsunade had quickly called Jiraiya to her office and tired to form a recovery team and a tracking team in hopes of tracking the Akatsuki before they extracted the Kayubi from Naruto. Kurenai remembered that day well since she, herself had been on the team along with Kaskahi. Asuma and Gai since they all were among Konoha's top shinobi and had experience fighting with at least two of the Akatsuki members. But before they left Danzo and Kaharu had stopped them stating that. If they left they would ruin their plan to destroy the Akatsuki it was at this point that Suande and Jiraiya demanded to know their plan to deal with the Akatsuki. The two elders then explained that when Naruto was being given the seals to stop him from using his chakra and keep him from telling anyone about Konoha. 
he was also given another seal that Danzo had some of his top seal masters create a seal that would be put over the seal that the Yandaimi created to seal up the Kyubi. Danzo's seal would only activate when the Kyubi was being extracted from him by the Akatsuki and once that happened Danzo's seal would cause all of the Kyubi's chakra to come out all at once causing a massive explosion that according to the seal master's calculations, would destroy anything from a 5 to 10 mile radius. Which would destroy the Akatsuki and then Konoha would claim to have destroyed the Akatsuki by using a new weapon to do it, where the other villages would then fear to attack Konoha for fear that they would use that weapon against them, they also informed Suande and Jiraiya that they need not bother trying to find them, since if the Akatsuki had indeed captured Naruto then they would have already began to extract the Kaiubi from Naruto and it would be too late for them to stop it. Kurenai scowled as remembered, when Danzo and Hamaru had explained their plan, it made her sick at how they would use an innocent boy in such a way. Kurenai also remembered Tsunade's and Jiraiya's reaction to the news. Since once Suande and Jiraiya had heard the plan they went ballistic and it took both the tracking team and the recovery team as well as 50 Anbu, that had arrived once they felt Jiraiya's and Suin's killing intent, to hold them both back from killing the two elders. Not that Kuriani or several others weren't tempted to do so and even joining them in killing the two elders, soon after, both Sanin stopped trying to kill the elders knowing that it would do no good after which they just broke down a cried. About a week after finding Naruto blooded jacket there had been no sign of any kind of explosion or reports of one. This, of course, caused a great deal of concern among the council since they had been informed of Danzo and Kaharu plan after Tsunade and Jiraiya had been told. When they learned this, most of the Ken heads as well as Homura had openly glared at the two elders, since they did not agree with what they did, even the two elders had begun to get concerned with no sign or reports of an explosion, it was not until Jiraiya asked the Toad's summons about Naruto, that they had informed them that Naruto was dead since the contract with them had expired. This left two possible outcomes, one, during the battle Itachi might have accidentally killed Naruto with his Amaterasu or the more likely one was that the Akatsuki had found Danzo's seal and removed it before they extracted the Kyubi from him, but it did not matter, Danzo and Kaharu plan had failed and Naruto was dead. Jiraiya left the village a few days later for a while, since he found it too painful to stay at the time, while Tsunade locked herself in her office for several hours where people all over the village could hear her crying at the loss of Naruto. When word got out to the villagers and other ninja that the demon was dead they started celebrating crying out the demon was dead but the party had not lasted long. When a teary-eyed Tsunade heard the celebrations she went down to the village square where the celebrations were happening and struck her fist right into the ground and caused the ground to shake and a fissure appeared in the middle of the village square stopping all celebrations. After which, Tsunade then released a massive amount of killer intent on the fools in which she told the fools that if there were any more celebration of Naruto's death or if she caught anyone trying to celebrate Naruto's death she would rip off their reproductive system whether it be man or women and then make sure that they would never chew solid food again either. After which, she let lose more killer intent to make her point clear where she then went back to her office to be alone with her sorrow. When Kuranai thought of that day she could not help but be saddened, she remembered when she, Asuma, and Guy went to tell Hinata and the others the news about Naruto's death, Kakashi had told them that they could tell the kids, since he had said to them that he had to go to the memorial stone. When the Konoha 12 heard about Naruto most of them had been greatly upset at what happened. Ten Ten had openly cried for her friend as did Kiba and Choji. Others like Shino, Shikamaru and Neji showed no real emotions other than lowering their heads. Since they preferred to keep such emotions bottled up inside and release them when they were alone. Lee had even stopped being himself for a few days and had hardly even said a word which showed how much it affected him, Konohamaru and his team started to cry the moment they heard, Konohamaru had refused to accept it at first but the proof could not be denied, even Sakura and Ino were said to have been upset at Naruto death, since after about 6 or 8 months since Naruto was banished the girls slowly began to change. According to Asuma Ino had changed due to a fight that she had with Shikamaru. When she had insulted Naruto in front of him after which he had smacked her in the face and had told her how stupid she was. Shikamaru then went into a rant about how Naruto had be a loyal ninja to the village as well as a hero. But was treated like shit by idiotic fools like her. He even told her about how useless she was at being a ninja and that she should quit if she didn't wake up soon since she spent her whole time dieting and make herself look good for Sasuke who would properly never look at her in any other way than a foolish fangirl. 
He also told her that if she didn't start to act like a serious ninja and start to get stronger she get herself and the rest of them killed when they try to protect her or she would get herself raped by enemy ninja. When he had finished Ino had broken into tears and ran home due to the truth and harshness of Shikamaru words. Fortunately soon afterwards Ino came back and asked her and Asuma as well as her father for training wanting to get stronger. Also according to Shizun Kuranai had heard that Sakura had also changed due to a verbal beating that Tsunade gave her when she was training her in medical ninjutsu, since Sakura had already started training with Tsunade before Naruto's banishment and had nearly stopped training her when she heard what Sakura had said and done to Naruto. According to Shizun during the training with Tsunade, where she had been harsh and very strict on Sakura in it, Sakura had made a mistake that might have killed a patient where Suande then gave her a harsh talking to about it. This of course caused Sakura to yell back at Tsunade stating that she was blaming her for Naruto being banished and stating that he was a danger to the village and that they were better off without him. This of course had not gone over well with Tsunade when Sakura had finished. Since from what Shizun told Kurenai Tsunade had grabbed the girl by the neck and slammed her against the wall and started to squeeze her neck nearing choking her after which Tsunade then gave her a similar but harsher verbal beating than Shikamaru gave Ino in which according to Shizun Tsunade had broken all the deluded beliefs that Sakura had built up for herself and broken Sakura from the inside. After which Tsunade threw her out of the room and told not to come back until she seen how stupid she had been. A few days later Sakura came back into Tsunade office and went on her hands and knees and begged for forgiveness and telling Tsunade she had realized how much of a blind stupid girl she had been and wanted to get stronger so that she could fix the mistakes that she had made one day find Naruto and help find a way to bring Naruto back and beg his forgiveness. After hearing Sakura heartfelt apology and seeing how sincere Sakura had been Tsunade took Sakura back, but had her trained twice as hard as she had before to which Sakura did not complain about. Kuranai had also heard that when both girls heard about Naruto death both had wept since neither of them had got a chance to apologize to Naruto for what they had done to him and try in some small way to make it up to him. Both the ramen chief Tenchi and his daughter Ayame were also distraught at the news of Naruto death when they heard they even closed down their store for several days due to their grief. Soon after they reopened their stand and had a large picture of Naruto hung on their wall of their stand as a small monument to Naruto they then even created a new ramen dish that they named after Naruto the Uzumaki Supreme Ramen Special. It was also common knowledge among the villagers that no one was ever to speak bad about Naruto in front of them especially Ayame. This unwritten law was created when one villager who had been having a meal at the ramen stand actually tried to take it down and smash the photo of Naruto stating that they should nt have the picture of the demon around. Unfortunately for said villager when Ayame caught him at what he was trying to do she attacked him where she then gave him the beating of all beatings that was so bad it could only be matched by the one Tsunade gave Jiraiya when she caught him at the first and only time he peeped on her in the hot springs. It got so bad that three nearby Jonin ninjas had to stand in and try and save the poor fool and stop her from killing him. When they tried to she then turned on them in which they were just barely able to hold her off and restrain her but not without each getting several cuts and bruises from restraining her since they found that Ayame was lethal with a kitchen knife. It took Suande herself to heal the idiot villager although from what Kuranai heard the poor fool was unable to eat solid food and now had a phobia of ramen which was learned when a nurse one time brought ramen for a meal and after seeing it he started to scream like a little girl and telling her to take it away and the muttering things like I be good. I be quiet. Please don't hit me. When word got out at what happened the villagers wisely decided to kept their opinions about Naruto to themselves especially around Ayame even the ninjas that still hated Naruto were too scared of her to say something bad about Naruto in front of her. When Aruka heard about Naruto death he had took several weeks of sick leave from the academy that he had stored up since he had been so distraught at the news and was unable to teach for a while. He spent most of his time at home. Kuranai remembered when she and a few others visited him they saw how pale he looked from not eating much was well as black lines under his eyes from not getting enough sleep and his eyes were also all puffy and red from crying most of the time even his place was a mess with clothes thrown around and dirty dishes left in the sink. It took a while but with the help Konohamaru and some others they were able to get Aruka out of his funk and back to teaching although many notice he still wasn't the same person he used to be and he refused to talk to anyone about how he really felt for a while. But out of all of Naruto friends to be affected by his death. Hanada took it the worse, since she was so devastated when she heard that she locked herself in her room for a month and refused to come out even when her father ordered her to. 
She barely ate and had it not been for Neji and her sister Hanabi visiting her every day to talk to her and get her to come out or eat a little she might have starved herself to death. She spent most of her time crying she had even once attempted to kill herself by cutting her wrists with a kanai fortunately Neji had arrived and found her before she had blend out and bandage her up and got her to the hospital in time, soon after Kuranai, Neji and Hanabi were able to talk to her and got her to stop going the path she was continuing on and that suicide was not the way and to keep living on for Naruto's sake. The only person that was not upset about Naruto death was Sasuke where when he heard he simply scoffed and said so the dope dead. So what it was bound to happen I just surprised he lasted as long as he did. Kurenai just scowled remembering when she first heard him say that she couldn't believe how anyone could be so cold-hearted to say something like that. She even remembered when her friend Azuki Yugo who told her that when she was watching the Uchiha train she heard him muttering about having to get stronger to kill his brother Itachi and she heard him mutter angrily about how he was now never going to get the chance to pay the dope back for defeating him and killing him to gain the Mangekyo Sharingan. When Kuranai heard she remembered how disgusted she was at how the boy would want to gain power in such a heartless and monstrous way. Soon after they heard that Nami no Kuni was having a funeral there in Naruto honor. Since they knew they would not have one in Konoha, the people of Nami no Kuni invited the entire Wasabi clan from Cha no Kuni. Lady Daimyo Koyuki of Haru, Yuki no Kuni, Shibuki leader of Takigakure. Kei's cage Sabaku no Gara and his brother Konkuro and sister Tamari. Suande had even planned to go herself as well as most of the others, but before they could they received a letter from Nami no Kuni stating that anyone from Konoha was forbidden to come to the funeral and if any tried to come they would be thrown out of the country by force, not wanting to cause an incident Tsunade cancelled the plans to go to the funeral. Kuranai sadly remembered when Shizune and Neji both told her that Hanada and Tsunade both cried themselves to sleep at not being able to properly say goodbye to Naruto again. Soon after Naruto funeral Danzo played another one of his cards and got the council to allow his root division to be reactivated Tsunade tried to overrule them but Kaharu played her own card by playing the card that Tsunade had used to stop the celebrations of Naruto banishment. Where it stated in the wartime emergency act that during a wartime emergency all military resources are be reactivated in the defense of the village and since the Akatsuki were still a major threat to the village with the possibility of them having extracted the Kyubi from Naruto all the resources of Konoha should be used to deal with them as well as the threat of Orochimaru, hence Suande was overruled and Danzo's root division had been reactivated and under his command. Soon afterwards word reached Konoha that the daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni, Lightning Country, Satake Dosen and most of his family along with their personal guards had been all killed in an ambush by unknown ninjas, not long after Dosen brother Satake Yoshiaki took over as daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni. Two months afterwards the incident the Yandaimi Rakage had been assassinated where the assassin or assassins had not been found. When Konoha heard this many feared that the fourth great shinobi world war would begin since the last time something like this happened, where the Sandame case cage went missing the third great shinobi world war had been triggered. Other people were beginning to fear that some unknown village or country was trying to make a power play and weaken and take over both Kumogakure no Sato, the village hidden in the clouds, and Kaminari no Kuni which could then trigger the fourth great shinobi world war by drawing other countries in. Fortunately Lord Daimyo Yoshiaki was able to quickly instate Amako Zankoro of the powerful Amako clan of Kumo as knew the Godem Rakage without incident. For six months nothing much happened until news came out about the deaths of the Yandaimi Rakage and the pervious daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni and his family. Where thanks to some ninjas loyal to the pervious Rakage where they discovered and released documents that proved that the current Godem Rakage Amako Zankoro and his clan made the treasonous plan with Yoshiaki where they had Yoshiaki brother Dosen and his family killed off making him the only legitimate heir to ruling Kaminari no Kuni. After which the Amako clan had the Yandaimi Rakage assassinated and the new Lord Daimyo Yoshiaki would make Amako Zankoro the new Godem Rakage making the Amako the ruling clan and most powerful clan in Kumo, after which both Yoshiaki and Zankoro would support one another and secure their positions in powers as the rulers of Kumogakure and Kaminari no Kuni. When the truth came out, Kaminari no Kuni quickly sealed their borders up before a five-year-long civil war broke out in the country where several different shinobi factions and shinobi clans who were either loyal to the pervious Rakage or simple enemies of the current Rakage went against the shinobi factions and the shinobi clans that were loyal to the Godem Rakage or simply sided with him. 
At the same time samurai lords and other wealthy and important families and lords quickly raised their own armies to try and gain power from the current daimyo Yoshiaki whether for themselves or for what Yoshiaki did which resulted in a long and bloody war for both Kumo and Kaminari no Kuni. Kuranai then thought back to the event three years after the news of Naruto death. Where the Godem Keizkage Sabaku no Gara was kidnapped by the Akatsuki members Akasuna no Sasori, Sasori of the Red Sand, and Didera of Iwagakure the explosive expert. Suna had sent word to Konoha for aid where Kakashi, Sakura, Sasuke and their new teammate Sai from the Root Division were sent along with Gai. 1010, Lee and Neji as backup as well with them was legendary puppet user of Suna. Chio who was Sasori grandmother, as they tracked down the Akatsuki members and the missing case cage they were met up by Sasuke older brother Uchiha Itachi and his partner former member of Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu, the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, Hoshigaki Kisame where they did battle, the team's eventual defeated the two but soon realized that it was not the real Hoshigaki Kisame and Uchiha Itachi the Akatsuki had used Shoten no Jutsu. Viz. Impersonation Jutsu which used human sacrifice to make exact copy of Itachi and Kisame with only a small percent of their true power. When the team's final got to the base the found the unconscious Gara laid on the ground, alive with his demons still inside him, in front of a destroyed Akatsuki base and when they looked inside they found about a hundred destroyed puppets which had burned marks on some of them as if hit by lightning. Others were frozen solid while most cut up into tiny pieces or blasted into pieces, when they searched the surrounding area of the base they also found a large portion of the forest behind the base covered in ice with many of the trees either torn down, blown to pieces or cut down as if hit by a hurricane or a bomb also many trees were even frozen solid with ice, they even found the second arm of Didera severed frozen in ice. After investigating what happened Chio examined Gara to see how he was, when she did she discovered that someone had altered his seal and improved it where Shukaku no longer affected Gara's sleep and it allowed him to better use and control the demon power without harm to him or chance of losing control. Chio had admitted herself that whoever had done it was a seal master far beyond her skill level. When the team reported what had happened both Suande and the council ordered an investigation at who could have done it Suande had even sent out Jiraiya. After he had returned at an earlier time, to try and find out who had saved the case cage and was strong enough to kill Akasuna no Sasori and possible Didera of Iwagakure unfortunately both Jiraiya and all other leads turned up empty leaving the question who could have done it unanswered. The only thing they did know for certain was it had been two people who had defeated the Akatsuki members since there had been two separate battlefields one in the cave and one in the forest. As Kuranai thought about this she could not help herself but ponder over who had saved the case cage since even after seven years they still had no clue. It was soon after that mission that Kuranai found out that she was pregnant, she remembered telling Asuma after he returned from his mission with dealing with his former comrade Kazuma in the Shugonin Junishi, 12 Guardian Ninja, who had tried to use his own son as a weapon to destroy Konoha since during the Kyubi attack he had somehow stored a large amount of the Kyubi chakra in his own son when she had told Asuma he had been ecstatic about being a father but sadly that never happened. Kuranai then felt a heavy pang in her heart when she remembered the day Shikamura told her about Asuma being killed by the immortal Akatsuki member Hidan on that day she felt as if her heart had been smashed to pieces knowing that she would never see him again or he would never see their child. Not long after Shikamura, Ino, Choji and Kakashi went after the two Akatsuki members they were later supported by Yamato. Sakura, Sai and Sasuke and together they had killed four of Kakuzu hearts and Shikamura was about to bury Haydn alive in a trap hole that he had tricked Haydn in falling into but before they could finish off both members another member of the Akatsuki arrived who called himself Zetsu and attacked them and distracted the two teams long enough for Kakuzu and Haydn to escape before retreating himself. Where the mission had become a totally failure and the Akatsuki were not seen or heard from for about four years afterwards. Kuranai the Rembert about three years after the failed mission to kill the Akatsuki members Kakuzu and Haydn hearing the news that the civil war in Kaminari no Kuni ended with the rebel factions winning the war. During the war at some point some unknown shinobi who called himself Denku had somehow united all the rebel Kumo shinobi factions into a united force and combined them with some of the other samurai clans that were against Daimyo Yoshiaki and defeated the combined forces of Daimyo Yoshiaki and the Godem Rakage. It was even rumored that he killed the Godem Rakage later Kuranai then learned that the former daimyo Yoshiaki was sent into exile by the new daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni his niece Satake Kicho. 
who had been able to escape the ambush attack by the Amako clan on her family caravan with the help of her samurai bodyguard the legendary samurai Naomasa Katsumoto of the Naomasa samurai clan and was hidden by him until the rebel leader Denku restored her into power. Denku was then declared as the new Rokudame Rakage and was also given another title to go by as well the Raiden no Kami, the god of thunder and lightning, due to his mastery over lightning jutsu. About a year after the civil war in Kaminari no Kuni ended the Rokudame Rakage with the help of Lady Daimyo Satake Kicho was able to stabilize the village and the country by somehow getting all the remaining factions that had fought with Daimyo Yoshiaki and the Godem Rakage to join him and Lady Daimyo Kicho willingly and united the village and country again. Not long after the Rokudame Rakage had somehow forged an alliance with Hoshigakure no Sado, the village hidden in the star, and Takigakure no Sado, the village hidden in the waterfall, as well as their countries Kuma no Kuni, Bear Country, and Taki no Kuni, Waterfall Country. Where all three countries and villages formed an alliance where they would support and protect each other in any and all aspects such as economically and militarily needs and would work together to reach the same goals. Not long after this new alliance the Rokudame Rakage was able to get Yuki no Kuni, Snow Country, and Yukigakure no Sado, the village hidden in the snow, to join Kumo new alliance and were then followed shortly by the hidden villages of Takumi no Sado, the hidden craftsman village, and Yugakir no Sado, the hidden hot springs village, who both wished to join the new alliance and were allowed to. After which when Takumi no Sato and Yugakir no Sato joined them in the new alliance it was then decided by the new member nations to give their new alliance a name in which it was called the Heavenly Alliance. Kuranai remembered hearing from Shizun about how nervous the newly formed Heavenly Alliance was making Konoha Council since it had growing rapidly in a very short time that it had been founded in and it had taken a great deal of Konoha missions from them not to mention the supposed new military strength it had. Kuranai also then remembered one morning two months after the newly formed Heavenly Alliance was created that the head of the Akatsuki member Kakuzu was found at the front of Konoha main gate and was staked on the his partner Hayden triple bladed scythe which in turn was stuck to the ground like a pole in font of the gate, on the head a note was stuck on it which said. May the spirit of Serutobi Asuma rest easy now knowing that his murders have been punished, may his wife, son, nephew and students also find peace knowing that he has been avenged. The note had been signed with a lightning bolt, when the news got to the Hokage. Kuranai heard that Tsunade had quickly sent Jiraiya out to find out who had done it. Where after a few weeks he returned to village and told them that he found out that it had been Akumo ninja that had killed Kakuzu and Haiden. He then told them he did not know the real name of the ninja. But he did know that he was called Sarai, Blue Lightning who had fought in the civil war and earned great fame in it and had earned the nickname Sarai due to the fact that he was said to move like lightning. He then told them that from what little information his information network could give him about Sarai. Where all they knew about him was that he was a mysterious shinobi even to the people of Kumo and few had ever seen his face since he did not go out in public and move too fast for people on the battlefield to get a good look at him the only thing they knew for certain about him was that he wore a bright blue trench coat with black lightning bolts on the bottom edges of the trench coat and had a kanji symbol for storm on his back. Jiraiya also learned that both Kakuzu and Haiden had sneaked into Kaminari no Kuni and ambushed the Jinchuriki of the Nibi no Bakaneko, two-tailed monster cat when she was returning from a mission and captured her and as they tried to leave the country with her. They were confronted by Sarai who fought and killed them both. This of course made both Suande and the council very nervous at the fact that Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance were becoming a serious major military power. Where they had the power of the Jinchuriki of the Nibi no Bakaneko and the Jinchuriki of the Hachibi no Kyogyu, eight-tailed giant ox, from Kumogakure as well as the power of the Jinchuriki of the Nanabi no Kabutomushi, seven-tailed horned beetle, from Takigakure. Not to mention the power of Sarai whom was strong enough to fight and kill two S-class missing ninjas, who were also believed to be have been immortal, at the same time. Not to mention the Rokudame Rakage who was said to be extremely powerful since he had killed the Godem Rakage, who was an extremely powerful ninja that even a Sanin would have trouble fighting against. Not to mention the rumor that was told, where nearing the end of the civil war in Kaminari no Kuni the former daimyo Yoshiaki sent for aid from Mizu no Kuni and Kirigakure no Sado promising them a large reward if they sent help to him. Where they sent a fleet of 50 warships with a force of 8,000 of the Mizu daimyo warriors and samurai as well as 2,000 ninjas from Kirigakure. But the fleet never returned, 
where a month later a single Kiri ninja returned half drowned and was said to have told the Godem Mizukage and the Mizu Daimyo that the fleet had been destroyed by a single man called Denku, aka the Rokudame Rakage, who created a massive typhoon when the fleet was nearing Kaminari no Kuni shores and destroyed it. Although the story had never been fully confirmed, since the Godem Mizukage had the ninja executed soon after hearing what had happened to the fleet, it was still enough to make many people in Konoha be wary of whatever power the Rokudame Rakage had, as well as earn the undying hatred of the Godem Mizukage who hated him about as much as the Yandaimi Suchikage hated the Yandaimi Hokage. Kuranai then just signed as she looked out more into the open sea in the past two years now. The Heavenly Alliance had grown in strength with several more countries either become part of the Heaven Alliance or just allying to the powerful alliance of nations. Countries like Numa no Kuni, Marsh Country, Tori no Kuni, Bird Country, Oni no Kuni, Demon Country, and no Kuni, Red Bean Jam Country, Cha no Kuni, Tea Country, Mitsu no Kuni, Honey Country, and Na no Kuni, Vegetable Country, joined the Heavenly Alliance while countries like Tsuki no Kuni, Moon Country, Kiba no Kuni, Fang Country, Sum no Kuni, Claw Country, Shu no Kuni, Neck Country, simply became allies to it but were not members of the alliance. But out of all the nations that had allied themselves, to the Heavenly Alliance none were more surprising, to the other shinobi nations and other countries than, when the powerful neutral military nation Tetsu no Kuni, Iron Country, broke at neutrality and allied itself to the Heavenly Alliance although the ruler of Tetsu no Kuni Lord Mifune made it clear in letters to all the other countries and shinobi nations that Tetsu no Kuni was allied to the Heavenly Alliance through mainly trade treaties and it would not involve itself in any wars that the Heavenly Alliance was in unless it was to defend the Alliance member nations when they are attacked unprovokedly and it would not attack or invade any country regardless of the situation. But still the fact that Tetsu no Kuni would break in. Long-standing neutrality and ally itself to Heavenly. Alliance showed how powerful and influential it had become and how it had grown especially Kumo since it had been Kumo that had gathered all these nations together to form a powerful alliance and even with the losses they suffered from their civil war it was the most powerful out of all the nations in the heavenly alliance and had more than likely gotten stronger over the past few years and it was certain that Kumo was very influential in the decisions in the heavenly alliance. As Kuranai thought about the Heavenly Alliance she remembered when the Council had sent several of Konoha top infiltrating experts into Kumo and gather information on the Heavenly Alliance and its strengths as well as Kumo's, but within a few days of the ninjas crossing into the border of Kaminari no Kuni they were caught by Kumo ninjas before they even reached Kumo itself and were then delivered back to Konoha gates with a warning not to try it again. As she remembered that incident Kuranai then thought how things had lead up to Konoha's current situation and the beginning of the Fourth Great Shinobi World War. During the time when the Heavenly Alliance was forming together Orochimaru decided to form his own alliance or to be more precise his own coalition of nations to help him destroy Konoha since after his failed attempt at getting Uchiha Sasuke and the power of his Sharingan he decided to secretly rise a new army of ninjas to destroy Konoha with as well as find new allies that hated Konoha as much as he did which he did after recruiting and training his forces and creating a larger army of sound ninjas than he had when he first invaded Konoha he then went and got Iwa to join him in his coalition due to their long-standing grudge against Konoha. After which he then got Kusa to join him which was not too surprising since Kusa and Konoha were never really friendly towards one another and it was fairly common knowledge that Kusa wanted to take Konoha place as a member of the five strongest shinobi nations. The next member to join was the Hanya clan from Hayashi no Kuni. Wood Country, who were thought to have been wiped out Danzo Root Division before they were first disbanded after the end of the Second Great Shinobi World War. Which was why the Hanya clan joined Orochimaru so to get revenge on Konoha for trying to wipe out their clan. The finally member to join was Kiri, who had joined due to the Mizukage wanting to expand his power and territory into the mainland of the Elemental Continent, with having so few allies and Suna being the only one with ninjas to help Konoha they knew that Konoha could not stand against such odds where they soon declared war against Konoha and sparked fourth great shinobi world war. The war had only started two months ago and there had yet to be any major battles there were some large skirmishes over some key positions in Hai no Kuni, fire country, but fortunately Konoha came out on top of most of them. Also Lucky Suna had agreed to join Konoha due to the fact that they wanted revenge against Orochimaru for killing Yandaimi K's cage and for tricking them into attacking Konoha. But even with this help Kurenai knew that in the long 
run they had little chance of beating Orochimaru coalition since they were being attacked on multiple different fronts and were vastly outnumbered not to mention Konoha was in great need of supplies and money if they wanted to survive this war hence why this mission to escort Princess Saki to Tasuki no Kuni was so important since it could help get them a trade alliance with Umi no Kanai and possibly Tasuki no Kanai which they desperately needed. Having enough of looking out into the endless sea Kuranai turned to face the main deck of the ship where the rest of her team where two of them were sparing while the third was reading a medical book. Kuranai team consisted of Akamichi Choji, Rock Lee and Haruno Sakura all four of them were Jonin rank and level. But since Kuranai was the most senior Jonin on the team she was team leader, as Kuranai watched Lee and Choji spar with one another she could not help herself but think how much the remaining Konoha 12 had changed a lot and grown up a lot over the past 10 years since Naruto banishment or to be more precise since Naruto death, she then started to look closely at Lee as he spared with Choji and then thought. No I am wrong not all of them have changed a lot since some had stayed the same especially Guy team thought Kuranai. Lee had not changed all that much at all to be honest Lee almost looked like a carbon copy of Guy he still wore the same green jumpsuit like Guy and wore his flak jacket over his jumpsuit much like Guy as well. When Lee started to rise in the ranks most did not expect him to get any higher than Tokabetsu Jonin, especially High Jonin. But he had proven them wrong since much like Naruto. Lee did not give up and despite his inability to use Chakra Lee rose through the ranks to becoming one of the strongest ninjas in the village where he could open all eight of the inner gates like Guy. Lee had also become so strong that only Guy could stand a chance against him in a pure taijutsu battle but even then he would lose most of the time to Lee since Lee had become stronger than Guy which had shocked most Jonin when they learned this since Guy was one of Konoha top Jonin. Lee soon earned the nickname the Konoha Naidame no Ketakai Aoimoju. Konoha's second prideful green beast. Another thing that happened to Lee which was properly the most surprising thing that happened with Lee was that he had gotten married to Kuranai old student Kurama Yukumo the new head of the Kurama clan since with the help of Suande and Jiraiya they were able to permanently seal away the demon inside her and then heal her body to a certain degree where she could do physical activities at a certain level. After which she then went to Guy and Lee to help with her physical training where Lee had been more than happy to do where eventually as they trained together they grew closer with one another since both had similarly dreams of being great ninjas even with their disabilities and knew what it was like to struggle with them. Eventually both Lee and Yakumo started to date and after two years of dating they got married when they were both 18 soon after Yakumo joined the interrogation unit of the Anbu division due to the fact that she could easily use her powerful genjutsu abilities to get prisoners to talk which made her one of their top interrogators. Also three years after they had gotten married Yakumo gave birth to their daughter Rock Karama Fuku who thankfully looked more like her mother than her father although she did have his hair color. Kuranai could not help put smile remembering when Lee fainted in the waiting room after the nurse came in and showed him the newly born Fuku soon after though Lee woke up and started to running around the village happily shouting out to everyone that he had a daughter. Currently little Fuku was now two years old and was the cutest thing you could see and was the apple of her father's eye where he could go on for hours talking about his little girl. Also he and Yakumo and made her and Guy, Fuku's godparents. Kuranai remembered how honored she felt when they asked her to she also remembered how Guy had shouted to the top of his lungs about how honored he was as well and how he and Lee would make little Fuku the next Konoha no Ketakai Aoimoju, Konoha's prideful green beast. That statement of course resulted with both Yakumo and her threatening the two men that they would put them both in permanent genjutsu comas where they would experience their manhoods being cut off slowly over and over again if they ever tried to corrupt little Fuku with their flames of youth this of course got the desired result and got the two men to go deathly white pale with fear and cover the manhoods and agree not to corrupt Fuku when she got older. Neji had changed a good bit too in some ways but had still remained the same in others ways despite the things that happened. Within three years after Naruto death Neji had risen to the ranks fairly fast and was made a Jonin. Also he had become so skilled at the time that in his Juken, gentle fist, skill level was at the level of his uncle Hyuga Hiyashi who was the strongest user of Juken in the Hyuga clan at the time. Neji even created several of his own techniques using Juken that had proven to be very powerful. Like Lee over the following years Neji grew stronger and was credited as one of Konoha's top Jonin. he even earned the nickname Higyushiroi, White Strike, due to the fact that Neji always wore white robes even in battle and was well known to be able to killing many different enemy ninjas with one strike. 
Neji had also dated 1010 for a while but that eventually did not work out and both decided to stay friends eventually Neji started to date a young girl from his clan and was now currently engaged to that girl. 1010 had changed too a bit after Naruto death, she became a lot more focused on her training and not only trained in weapons but in taijutsu and ninjutsu a bit more although she was still better when fighting with weapons. After Naruto's death she went to Guy and asked him to help her improve her taijutsu skill later on 1010 then had come to Kuriani and asked her for someone to help her with her ninjutsu in which Kuriani had gotten her friend Azuki Yugo to help her with 1010's ninjutsu. Yugo had also helped 1010 in her skill with a sword since she was the top kenjutsu user in the village and had been only second to her late lover Gekko Hayate. Eventually not long after the mission with the rescue of the Godem Kaze Cage 1010 had went to Suande and begged her to train her to which Suande agreed to but only to a degree since she knew that 1010 was not a medic nin and there was not much she could train Tenten in. But she was still able to teach her a few combat just us that revolved around medical jutsu as well as the secret to her superhuman strength although it took 1010 several more years before could use it correctly and even then she could not use it to the same level as Tsunade and Sakura could. She could still use it well enough to give her a big advantage in fight. Two years after the incident with the Godem Kaze Cage 1010 was accepted into the Anbu division and was put into the assassination unit of Anbu due to the fact that she was an assassin type ninja. After a year in joining Anbu she was made a captain and earned a nickname in the bingo as Okami Ken no Konoha. Konoha's blade mistress. Famed for her skill in bladed weapons or specifically sword fighting and was now credited as the best sword user in Konoha. She also had quickly became known as Konoha top assassin in the Anbu as well, which had caused Anko to whine for a couple of days since she used to have been Konoha top assassin in the Anbu, and was now the chief commander of the assassination unit in Anbu. 1010 herself did not try and date anyone else after the failed relationship with Neji, since she decided to concentrate on her carer more and worry about finding a relationship with someone later. Kuriani then started to focus on Choji as he spared with Lee and could not help but smile sadly at how much her former husband's team had grown and changed and thought about how proud he would have been if he saw how they had grown, since after Azuma death the three of them grew stronger where eventually they became no as the Neo Ino Shikacho but even then they each rose and grew stronger individually. Choji had changed a great deal over the years he was no longer fat since he had now replaced it with muscles and wore samurai like armor and would carry a large battle axe on his back. He had also mastered all his family jutsus and was now a member of Konoha Demolition Unit and would soon become the leader. Since his mastery of his family jutsus, where he could expand any part of his body and grow larger made him perfect for destroying enemy bases and fortress and had once destroyed an entire castle belonging to a corrupt warlord by himself before a war started. He had even earned the nickname Konoha no Kyojin Keiud, Konoha Strong Armed Giant, Choji later on even married a young civilian girl who had worked in one of his family restaurants as one of their top chiefs, this was of no big surprise, since Akamichi men were well known for marrying women that were excellent cooks since they were known to love their food about as much as they love their wives. Shikamaru had not changed too much he was still lazy like all Naris but he wasn't as bad as he used to be after Asuma death, which had affected him greatly, he took his reasonabilities more serious and he trained a lot harder. He had even began to use Asuma trench knives in battle. After Asuma death he swore that when Asuma and Kuriani's son Hiruzen, named after his grandfather, became a genin he would train him like Asuma had trained him. Over the years Shikamaru grew in rank much like the others he eventually even took his father position as Konoha's Jonin strategic commander when his father retired from the position. It was a position that suited him well since he had an even keener mind than his father had when it came to strategy and it had been because of Shikamaru that Konoha had won most of its skirmishes with Orochimaru and his allies. During the years Shikamaru had dated the Godem Kaze Cage older sister Sabaku no Tamari for a while but much like with Neji and Tenten the relationship it did not work out well and they decided to break it off since from what she had heard from Ino the reason was because Tamari wanted someone who was not only intelligent and strong but also more energetic. Soon after Shikamura then started to see a young girl called Shiho from the Codebreaker unit where they eventually married where when asked by some people why he married her he just replied she was the less troublesome woman I knew. Although despite that comment everyone knew he cared for Shiho very much and they were even expecting their first child together to which Shikamura had told Kuriani that if it was a boy they were going to call him Asuma which had made Kuranai smile since she knew how honored Asuma would have been to be the namesake of Shikamaru's first son. 
Eno had changed the most out of the team even with her bad start out of the academy with being a fangirl for Sasuke and her taking the side of the villagers for the first few months after Naruto banishment she changed a great deal for the better especially with the death of Asuma, since it had been her first time seeing someone she cared about die in front of her eyes. After Asuma death she started to train even harder she even went to Anko for training something that she had regretted doing for two years as she went through Anko brutal training regimens. But it had all paid off in the end and she had even mastered all of her family mental jutsus. After which she then joined the interrogation unit in Anbu with Yakumo. Ino was also in the running for the next chief commander of the interrogation unit with Yakumo since like her Ino had become one of the interrogation unit top interrogators much like her father as well due to her mastery over her family mental jutsus and because she was able to use her sexily appeal on male prisoners, and some women, much like Anko had when she interrogated prisoners. Ino had even developed a little sadistic side not to mention a blood fetish much like Anko as well which Kurinai blamed on the fact the Ino had spent too much time with with her friend during those two years of training hence it only figured that a bit of Anko personality was rubbed off on Ino. Several years after Naruto death Ino even married herself. She had married the young root member Sai who took her family name on since he did not know his own. Kurinai had often seen the two together and they both seemed to be very happy together despite the fact that Sai began as an emotionless young man who always wore a fake smile. But eventual after hanging around the Konoha 12 gang he started to regain his emotions. Ino had even helped him get over his repressed memorizes from his horrific training in Root that had began to resurface as he regained his emotions, over time Ino and Sai grew closer since Ino had seen what Sai had gone through in his training in Root through her using her family mental jutsus to explore his memories, and where she then helped him deal with his repressed memorizes after which they then started to date and after a year of dating they got married. As she thought about how Anko helped changed Ino's life Kurinai could not help but remember how she also helped Aruka out when dealing with the loss of Naruto. Where when Anko saw how Aruka was not himself when he came back to teaching she decided to help Aruka out. Since she had some knowledge of what it was like to be an outcast like Naruto due to her connection with Orochimaru which had caused her to be an outcast with the villagers. Eventually over time she was able to get Aruka to open up to her and help him deal with the pain he felt with Naruto death. And over time a strong bound was built between them. Where three years after Naruto death, two years since. They started dating, Aruka proposed to Anko and they. Got married where Anko left the interrogation unit. But still helped out part time, and became a full. Jonin and after a year after they had gotten married. Anko gave birth to their daughter Aiko who was five. Now and was like a miniature Anko and Naruto rolled. Up into one person due to her love of Dango and her ability to scare people as well as her love of playing pranks and causing chaos she even had a bit of a fetish for causing explosions and destruction, which on more than one occasion she caused several minor explosions in the village, although she was a bit calmer that either Naruto and Anko she was even quite intelligent for her age and was quite skilled since she could already use her chakra and do both tree climbing and water walking not to mention her control over her chakra was flawless. Kurinai then thought about her now young nephew Konohamaru and his friends had grown and changed over the years after Naruto banishment and death. Konohamaru had changed a great deal since Naruto death since soon after he heard about Naruto death he started to train even harder to become Hokage since he wanted to do it and honor Naruto memory. Where Konohamaru had went to Asuma and asked him to train him in his grandfather fighting style the crazy monkey fist he even later on signed the monkey summoning contract and got Enma to train him in bojutsu. After Asuma was killed Konohamaru trained even twice as hard since he now lost his parents. His grandfather and his uncle leaving her and Hiruzen is the only family he had left in the world where he moved in with her. Over the next few years Konohamaru grew stronger where he learned how to do many of the jutsus that his grandfather could use as well as combine them he even leaned and mastered the Yandaimi famed Rasengan that he learned from Jiraiya who had taught him it due to his connection to Naruto and due to the fact that he was his sensei grandson. Konohamaru had even created his own fighting style that worked well with either with bojutsu or taijutsu as a fighting style. He called the fighting style the drunken monkey fist which was a combination of the crazy monkey fighting style and the drunken boxer fighting style that he learned from Lee. The drunken monkey fighting style combined the unique agility and speed of the crazy monkey fist in the power as well as the unpredictable fighting moves of the drunken boxer fighting style. 
The fighting style was so unpredictable and the moves so random that not even Kakashi's and Sasuke's Sharingan could predict what moves Konohamaru would make next whenever he spar with either of them. Over the next six years Konohamura rose through the ranks very quickly where he had just recently become a janin and was one of Konoha top janin already and earned the nickname Konoha no Enku, Konoha's Monkey King, which had irritate Enma for a while with people giving his title to Konohamaru as a nickname. Although despite that it caused Kuranai to smile knowing how proud his grandfather and uncle would be of him. Another thing about Konohamaru was that he was now head of the Serutobi clan and member of the council not to mention he was also now engaged with Hanada's younger sister Hanabi, the two of them had started to date when Konohamaru and her both became Chunin when they were 16 and both were now 18 and were both Janin, since Hanabi became one about a month after Konohamaru did. Konohamaru teammates Udon and Moegi also changed and improved a great deal over the years. Both were now Tokabetsu Janin, where Moegi was a one of Konoha top Genjutsu users due to after Naruto death Moegi had came to her to be a Genjutsu specialist since Moegi had refused to learn from her grandmother Kaharu since she blamed her for Naruto death since she was one of the people that got Naruto banished from the village. Udon had also improved a good bit too since he became a skilled fighter thanks to his training from Gai and Asuma, before he was killed as well as a skilled strategist in which he was second in command to Shikamaru as strategist to Konoha, both Udon and Moegi had even recently married to one another and were happy together. Kuranai then turned and looked at Sakura who was reading a medical book at the time as well as sometimes look up from her book to watch Choji and Lee spar with one another for a few minutes, Kuranai then started to think about how Team 7 had changed since Naruto banishment and death. Sakura had changed a great deal since Naruto's banishment and death and like Ino, Sakura had thought Naruto is a demon and a danger to the village. But after verbal beating that Suande gave her it had woken her up to how much of a fool she had been as well as how wrong she had been as well. After Naruto's death she became depressed for a while due to the fact that she would never be able to apologize to Naruto for what she did to him and to try and make it up to him. Eventually she got past her depression and became more force on her training as a medic nin where by the time she was 16 she was a chunin and a highly skilled medic which she had proven when she helped heal the K's cage brother Konkura when he was poisoned by Akasuna no Sasorifin the K's cage was kidnapped. Her skill as a medic nin grew more over the years and she had also grew in rank and became a janin and was one of Konoha's top medics and was the assistant deputy head of the hospital, with Shizun being the deputy head and Tsunade being the head of the hospital. She was also given the nickname Konoha no Chiyu Sakura, the healing Sakura of Konoha. Also many people believed that her skill as a healer rivaled that of Suande where given a few more years she would be as good if not even better than Suande. Sakura wore. Go to profile to find link to a picture of what Sakura wearing and looks like but without the tattoo in the picture, also like 1010 Sakura did not bother trying to get into a relationship with anyone after she realized how dark Sasuke was becoming and saw what he was becoming with her own eyes and had decided to focus her time on improving her medical skills. Next there was Sai and although Sai was not an original member of the Konoha 12 where he did not join until after Naruto was banished he did become a part of it once the others began to get him to open up and began to trust him. But that had took a while since Sai was a perfect byproduct of Danzo root program where he had no name unless Danzo gave him one and was trained to have no emotions or suppress them but eventually the bond he witnessed most of the Konoha 12 have with one another interested him where they used that to bypass Danzo training and get Sai to show emotions. Soon enough he did start to open up and he too began to change and started to show his emotions more to them. Although he suffered from traumatic memories from time to time after he started to open up his emotions which was due to the horrific training that took part in but that it was later on fixed by Ino, with use of her family mental jutsus, whom he later on married. Over time Sai learned about Naruto and what he was like and became interested in hearing more about Naruto saying that he sounded like his friend Shin who he had considered like his brother at one point until he died of an illness in which Sai had stated that he was sure he would have liked Naruto had he met him. Then there was Sasuke which caused Kuranai to frown as she thought about the boy over the years he had grow darker and darker and became more fixated on gaining power to kill his brother. He got Kakashi to train him privately and teach him as many jutsus and other things as he could so that could get stronger. Also with Danzo, Kaharu and the civilians help he was able to get a seat on the council which had not happened before since even though the Uchiha clan was a clan of Konoha they had no seat on the council like the rest of the clans since they ran the military police hence they could not have say in political matters of the village which now changed when he became part of the council. 
After the mission with retrieving the K's cage Sasuke seemed to get even darker than he already had been due to the fact that during the battle with the fake Itachi where Sasuke had killed him Sasuke had believed that for a brief few moments he had finally killed his brother but when it was revealed that it wasn't the real Itachi he had felt cheated and angered plus during the battle Itachi had said something to Sasuke to anger him further. Sasuke was also angered that when they found that the Akatsuki base had been destroyed and Sasori dead and his partner Didera was missing which resulted in a miss opportunity to find his brother and kill him. Soon after the failed mission to kill Haydn and Kakuzu Danzo recruited Sasuke to his root program where with Danzo help through his special and advanced training program Sasuke quickly grew stronger over the years and rose in ranks where he was now the head captain of Danzo root division and was answerable to Danzo and sometimes Suande but only if Sasuke had done something against the village laws. But what sickened Kurenai most as well as many other shinobis was that the civilian part of the council not to mention the villagers and many shinobis in Konoha were trying to get Suande to make Sasuke her successor as the Hokage it was even supported by Danzo and Kaharu although all the clan heads and most of the shinobi population as well as Homura were against it. This of course caused Kurenai to pray daily that it would not happen since if Sasuke did become Hokage she feared for Konoha's sake. Sasuke had also yet to marry not that there were a lack of women willing to marry him since many civilian women had offered themselves to him as well as high-ranking and wealthy civilian families offered their daughters to him in arranged marriages to Sasuke the council had even gave him the clan restoration act to marry multiple women to rebuild the Uchiha clan quickly but Sasuke had turned them all down since he seemed too fixated on killing his brother than to worrying about restoring his clan in Konoha. Kurenai then decided to move her thoughts from Sasuke and think about how much her old genin team had changed and grown over the years. Out of all of Konoha 12 Shino had changed the less amount as he remained like all Abarame. Stoic and logically thinking all the time and only spoke when needed. Although despite his lack of changing personality-wise he had moved up the ranks in Konoha quite high where he was the chief commander of the Anbu Hunter Ninja Division due to his high skill in finding missing ninjas and cool logically thinking. He had also grown very strong during the last 10 years since he mastered all his clan jutsus and created several of his own he was also the strongest in his clan and was due to take the title as clan head from his father next year. Shino had also gotten married to a young civilian girl, who had not been frightened or disgusted away by Shino harboring bugs in him, which surprised Kurenai and many others since many didn't think Shino could be talkative enough to talk to a girl on a date and keep her interested but he had proven them wrong. Kiba had not changed too much either since he was still hot-headed and brash as he was when he was younger like most in Azuka. But he had changed enough in some ways where he was not as loud as he used to be and did not rush into a fight he actually would think and plan before he enter a fight, which had greatly surprised Kurenai when she saw him think out a plan of attack during a mission. Over the years Kiba had learned and master all his clan jutsus and even improved on some of them as well as create his own ones with his partner Akamaru who was now the size of a large bear who Kiba could now ride on in battle or travel on. Kiba had even grow quite high in ranks of Konoha like the other members of Konoha 12 where he was now the second in command of the Anbu Hunter Ninja Division under Shino. Also unlike most of the other male members of the Konoha 12 Kiba was still single although it was not from a lack of trying since he had dated several different girls both civilian and shinobis alike but all of his dates with them turned out with him saying or doing something perverted which resulted in him being beating by each of the girls. But out of all the members of the Konoha 12 that had changed over the years Hanada had been the one that had changed the most. After Naruto banishment she was depressed for months where she barely said a word and did very poorly during her training with Kurenai and her father as well as during missions but just when she seemed to get out of her depression news of Naruto death came out after which she had locked herself in her room and had tried to kill herself. After Hinata failed suicide attempt she had started to get better when Neji and her sister as well as Kurenai herself had talked to her and get her to live on for Naruto's sake but that had then changed during a spar with her father that she had done poorly in. Flashback three months after Naruto death pathetic said Hiyashi. As Hinata fell on the ground tired and hurt from training with her father. You hardly even improved in the slightest in your juken in the past year I expected you to have become better by now with that blonde Jinshuriki boy that you had a crush on gone, said Hiyashi. This caused Hinata to look up at him in surprise yes I knew about your crush on him I had hoped that with him gone you would have focused on your training more and gotten better but it seems that I was wrong you only gotten worse I not even sure that you make a even decent brach member. Maybe Neji should have just let you die when you tried to kill yourself and save the clan from bearing the humiliation of having you in the main house or even as a member at all, 
said Hiyashi as he sighed in disgust of her. Hiyashi the looked down at her in disgust and then said. Perhaps if you had died when you tired to end your life earlier then you might have then been with that pathetic Jinchuriki boy since clearly he could never be Hokage despite what he thought and the only reason why he was able to be Neji was because of his use of the Kyubi chakra. Perhaps Konoha would be better off without the both of you. No I certain it would be better off without the both of you since it is clearly better off without him in it since he was a clear threat to the village safety with his continued inability to control the Kyubi power and was putting it in danger and putting the village in the line of fire of the Akatsuki since they were after him and would have destroy the village to get him. Yes there is no question to that both our clan and the village are better off now that he dead. After which Hiyashi then turned around and began to walk away where he had his back facing her. Becoming Hokage ha has if an idiotic fool like him could have become Hokage let alone even a cage and idiotic dreamer that all her was said Hiyashi as he continued to walk away. But had he looked back he would have seen a look in Hanada that no one had ever seen in her before a look of pure hatred and rage. Flashback ends Kuranai remembered how anger she was when she heard Hiyashi. Since she had come to visit Hanada at the time and decided to stay hidden behind a tree as she overheard the conversation she had even been sorely tempted to beat the living crap out of Hiyashi for saying such hateful and heartless things to Hanada. Soon after the conversation and when Hiyashi had left Kuranai went to Hanada to comfort her but when she got to Hanada she simply told her that she was okay and that she was used to her father saying such things. Kuranai had know that Hanada was lying to her but decided to let it go and let Hanada come to her to talk to her about it when she was ready but she never did. Over the next three years Hanada became like Shino where she barely spoke to anyone even to Kuranai she would often disappear and come back with bursts on her body and whenever Kuranai talked to her about it she simply told her that she was okay and that she was just training. It was then when Hanada was 16 that during a meeting of the entire Hyuga clan. Hanada exercised her right and heiress of the Hyuga clan to challenge Hiyashi as clan head which had shocked everyone both in the Hyuga clan and in the entire village. Kuranai remembered just before the match between Hiyashi and Hanada how she, Neji and Hanabi had tried to talk her out of fighting her father since they had all believed that she would just get herself killed, but Hanada had refused to give up Kuranai even remembered Hiyashi offering her a chance to give up and not be humiliated in front of the Hokage and the entire village, since the match was in the village arena to which Hanada refused. Flashback fight when Neji, the proctor of the fight, said begin. Both activated their Byakugan Hanada then disappeared in a burst of speed that could only be matched by Guy or Lee without their weights. She then reappeared in front of Hiyashi who was too shocked at her level of speed to react in time to dodge the Chakura no Mesu, Chakra Scalpel, strike, which she had activated when she ran at him, to his chest and then delivered a side kick to his head and sending him several feet away from her. Hiyashi had quickly recovered from the surprise attack but began to breathe heavily and cough due to the damage in his lungs, due to the Chakura no Mesu strike disrupting his breathing in his lungs. Have you fallen so far in your use of the Jukan that you had to use medical techniques to fight me with, have you not shamed the Hyuga clan enough with your failings? You're a disgrace to our noble clan said Heishi in a cold voice. Disgrace? said Hanada if anyone who is a disgrace it is you father, saying it in disgust. You and the all the elders who are too stuck in their old ways to accept changed you are all prideful blind fools who believe that our eyes and our Jukan style are enough and believe that to use jutsus and other techniques is to lower ourselves. Which is clearly wrong, since all it does is make us weaker. We are no noble clan since no noble clan would treat their own clan members in such a way like we have by making our kinsmen no better than human shields and slaves. You and the elders claim that our eyes see everything yet you and the elders are all blind to the simple truth, which is that eventually the Hyuga clan will have to change from its old barbaric ways and that there are many different types of strength which cannot be easily seen by simply how well they fight or do something which is why you will lost this fight said Hanada with a calm yet equally cold and confident voice much like Hiyashi's. This of course got Hanada many angry glares from the Hyuga elders for insulting them and their traditions. You impudent child said Hiyashi or a barely contained snarl. He then attacked with several Jukan strikes which Hanada easily dodged all of them. Hiyashi quickly began to loss his clam exterior and attacked her with his Hake Rokuhuian show, 8 trigrams 64 palms. To which Hanada quickly fell in a stance and the called out Shugohake Rokuhuian show, protection of the 8 trigrams 64 palms, and blocked all of Hiyashi attacks from his Hake Rokuhuian show with some kind of unknown technique and left several cuts on his hands and fingers. 
This of course got her wide eye shocked looks from everyone especially the Hyuga clan members since they had never seen or heard of this technique. WW what was that technique you used? Asked Hiyashi with clear shock in his voice and on his face. It is my Shugoheik Rokuhuian show it is a technique that I created from my knowledge of Juken that allows me to use my natural flexibility along with my high chakra control to emit a constant stream of chakra from my palms. Creating extremely sharp chakra blades, with my natural flexibility. I can reach any point around me, and allowing me to hit any target or defend against any attack within my field of vision. Also as you also saw while using this jutsu, my hands move extremely fast. Allowing me to hit hundreds of targets with extreme precision much like your Hake Rokuhuian show as well as defend against such attacks like the Hake Rokuhuian show making it the perfect technique to use to block the Hake Rokuhuian show. Additionally, I can control the size of the chakra beams in my palms, allowing me to create larger, arc-shaped chakra beams that spread out across my entire attack range cutting anything in it path in half, in a way this is my absolute defense since it effect are somewhat similar to that of the Hakesho Katen, 8 trigrams palms heavenly spin, in this way, the technique can be used as both an offensive and defensive maneuver, said Hanada in a calm voice with a hint of pride. Many in the crowd especially the Hyuga clan members could not believe that the shy mink young heiress could create such a technique by herself. But before Hiyashi could fully comprehend what he had heard from his failure of a daughter Hanada disappeared from his sight again and reappeared in front of him aiming a Juken strike right at his chest, but thanks to years of experience from many different battles when he was an active ninja doing missions he was able to dodge the attack to a degree where the strike only hit his left arm unfortunately he was not prepared for the pain that went through his now shattered arm. Roared Hiyashi clutching his now shattered arm with his other arm what dd did you dd do said Hiyashi as he grind his teeth together trying to fight off the pain that he felt from having the bones in his arms being shattered. It is another technique that I created that I call Degeki Sendo, Death Strike. I created from my training with Suande Sensei. Since three years ago after your little speech to me about how I would be better off dead, which caused many gasps from people in the audience to gasp at shock at how Hiyashi could say such a thing to his own daughter, I went to Suande Sensei and asked her to train me. Which she agreed to, during which over the past three years she been teaching me in secret many medical techniques and training me into becoming stronger she even taught me the basic of how her super strength has worked and how it is used in which over the years i combined the basic of this technique with my juken and my high chakra control to allow me to send massive and concentrated pulse waves of chakra through my fingertips into any object that i hit causing it to shatter and break with a single strike but for a person depending on the amount of chakra I use I can break or shatter a bone until it noting but pieces as well as do a great deal of internal damage in their body and what you got father, saying the name with venom, was with me just using a small amount of chakra said Hanada with a cold and cruel smile that had appeared on her face when she had spoken. Which had sent a shiver of fear down Hiyashi spine as well as the spines of many other people in the audience who were watching the fight between the father and daughter. After finishing speaking Hanada then disappear again from sight and reappeared in front of Hiyashi and delivered another Degeki Sendo at his chest causing him spit out blood as he was sent sailing across to the other end of the arena and hit the wall and leave a large dent in it. As Hiyashi struggled to keep himself standing Hanada appeared in front of him again and hit him with several more of her Degeki Sendo causing him to smash against the arena wall several more times making the dent in the wall bigger and causing more of Hiyashi bones to break and shatter as well as causing more internal damage in his body. Many people in the audience could not help but flinch, cringe and look away as they heard Hiyashi screams of pains as well as the sounds of his bones breaking and shattering from Hanada attacks. Hanada soon stopped and just when everyone thought she was done she quickly went in the Hake Rokuhuian Sho stance and accompanied the Hake Rokuhuian Sho with her Degeki Sendo technique and attacked, causing Hiyashi to scream into the high heavens in pain as every bone in his body was either broken or shattered from Hanada's relentless attacks and was then sent right through the arena wall and flew about a hundred feet outside the area wall and crashed in a crumpled blooded heap. It was then that Hyuga Hiyashi the head of the Hyuga clan the said to be the strongest Hyuga in Konohagakure and who prided himself on his strength and power was now a broken cripple of a man his silk white ropes were now covered in dirt and in his own blood every one bone in his body was broken or shattered. His entire body screamed in pain from his daughter's attacks he was coughing up large amount of blood and could barely breathe let alone move he was certain that all his ribs were broken and that he had a punctured lung and god knows what else he could barely even stay conscious due to the pain he was feeling. Hiyashi also knew that if he did not get imitate medical attention he'd be dead within minutes. 
It was then that Hanada suddenly appeared over him with a look that was so cold that it could have frozen water, and for the first time in many years Hyuga Hiyashi head of the Hyuga clan and so-called strongest Hyuga in Konohagakure felt true soul-wrenching terrifying fear run through his body as he looked into his daughter's cold lavender eyes that seemed to freeze his very soul in fright. Hanada then raised he hand for one more final strike ready to finish him when suddenly Neji and a dozen or so Hyuga branch members appeared and held her so to stop her final strike which was just mere inches from Hiyashi heart. Hanada-sama please stop this there is no need for this you won. You have beating your father you're the new leader of the Hyuga clan. Hanada please. He not worth killing this is not you. This not what Naruto would want you to become, said Neji with both worry and fear in his voice fear of what his once kind-hearted, sweet, shy and gentle cousin was becoming. For a moment it looked like Hanada might try and do it, but once Neji said Naruto name it got to her and she removed her hand away from her father heart slowly and nodded her head, showing that she was finished where Neji and the other Hyuga branch members let go of her. After they did Hanada then kneeled down to her father. Fearing that she was going to attack again the Hyuga branch members tensed up and were about to grab hold of Hanada again when Neji stopped them with a shake from his head to tell them to stop and to wait and see what happens. Hanada then lowered her head to her father left ear and whispered in a low voice, but was still loud enough for Neji and the branch members to hear what she was saying. Who the pathetic one now father said Hanada in a harsh whisper and saying the last word as if it was the vilest thing in the world. Hanada then got up and calmly walked away with her back now to her father. Had she looked back she would have seen and single sad tear fall from Hiyashi right eye right before blacked out from pain. Flashback ends after the fight Hanada was official. Made the new head of the Hyuga clan after which she. Then called a meeting with the Hyuga council of elders where she told them that as the new Hyuga clan head she was having the cage bird seal removed from all branch members and was having the Hyuga council of elders disbanded and reformed made up of members from both the main house family and the branch members she was also removing that law that stated her clan could only use jutsu that belonged to her clan and were only to learn other jutsus if required by village law. With this law gone any member of the Hyuga clan could learn jutsus outside the clan. When the Hyuga elders tried to object to her, she simply hit one of the clan council room walls with her Degeki Sendo and destroyed the entire wall, where she then stated to them that if they had a problem with how she was going to rule the clan they could challenge her to a fight to overrule her or to take the position as clan head from her. This of course got the desired result and the Hyuga elders back down since they had all seen her fight with her father after which word had quickly spread throughout the entire village earning her a fearful reputation that could only be matched by Suande or one of the Senen. Soon after the Hyuga clan cage bird seal was removed from all the branch members and the Hyuga clan council of elders was to be disbanded and reformed with three members from the branch members making up half of the council while three younger and more open-minded main house members making up the other half of the council, Neji was also made part of the council where he was made the leader of the clan council by Hanada and was made her personal advisor. Over the following years Hanada continued to be an active ninja doing missions and quickly became a janin and from doing several high rank missions and was mentioned in several shinobi nations bingo books and had also earned the nickname Hyuga Shikyo no Megami, Hyuga's goddesses of death, with a battle with extreme caution warning on her profile in the books. Also whenever she went out on mission she would leave Neji, Hanabi or someone from the new Hyuga clan council that she trusted in charge of the clan until she returned. Hanada also even improved her Degeki Sendo to such as level that it rivaled the striking and destructive power that Suande's superhuman strength was capable of, where she could destroy an entire building with a single strike and cause a fissure in the ground if need be, she also even helped out in the hospital from time to time and had become a very well respected healer with her skill being only surpassed by Suande, Shizun and Sakura. As Kurenai thought at how her old student, who she had thought as a surrogate daughter or surrogate younger sister at least, had changed she could not help but see at how sad her student still seemed as well as lonely even though she acted as a cold and emotionless Hyuga to the villager. Visiting dignitaries and some of the council members she still remained the kind and gentle young girl many knew her as where she would greet her patients, her friends and certain people like Kurenai herself with a smile and talk to them and offer them help from her if needed, but many could tell that she was still hurting on the inside since she had never truly recovered from Naruto death. As Kurenai finished thinking about Hanada she could not help but then think about her so-called father Hiyashi after his battle with Hanada he spent the next year in hospital due to the damage he had suffered from fighting Hanada. 
Despite Suande getting him to the hospital as quickly as she could he was on death's doorstep when he got there where after almost six hours of operating on him and trying to heal him Suande had been finally able to stabilize him. He spent the next year in the hospital under constant supervisions under Sakura. Suande and Shizun since the damage to him was so great that it took that long just to heal his body and bones it even took six more months before he was able to walk under his own power. During that time not one single person other than Sakura, Suande and Shizun or the hospital nurses visited him, this was because many people had heard about what had he done and said to his daughter where many people had been disgusted with how he had treated his own daughter and most people had lost all their respect for the man. But even despite weight he had done Kuranai could not help but feel pity for the former Hyuga clan head since she had seen him on several occasions and whenever she saw him she did not see the once proud and strong Hyuga man that was once head of one of the most powerful and noble clans in the village. He was gone now and all she saw was a broken shell of a man who did not hold himself proud and strong like he once had he couldn't even look at anyone in the face Kuranai had once spoken to him and when she looked into his eyes for a moment she saw shame self-loathing and guilt in them. A year of being in the hospital alone with no one to visit him and some one to talk to had left Hiyashi in great deal of time to think about the things that he had said and done over the years with his daughters where he had most likely come to realize how much of a cold-hearted prideful bastard he had become and what he had done to his daughters especially Hanada. Hanada had not only broken Hiyashi's entire body she had also broken his spirit and pride and was nothing but a shell of a man he could not even speak to Neji or to either one of his daughters since whenever he had tried the guilt and shame of what he had done over the years overwhelmed him, Kuranai had heard many say that this was simple karma for what he had done. Others had said it was poetic justice for his crimes to his daughter and his family some had even said he got what he deserved. But regardless of that Kuranai still pitied the man Hiyashi had indeed reap what he had sowed and got what he had wanted Hanada had indeed become the strong and powerful Hyuga clan head that he wanted her to be but it had cost him dearly to do it a price that Kuranai herself though was far too high a price to make it worth it all. Since Hiyashi had lost the love and respect of both his daughters and the rest of his family and he was now alone and paying for it every day and would have to live with what he had done for the rest of his life. Having thought enough of the past ten years and what had happened and changed in those years Kuranai decided to focus on in accomplishing her mission and getting back to her son as soon as possible. Where she hoped would be without incident, unfortunately that hope would soon be dashed and any hope of seeing her son soon would also be dashed as well. Several miles away several miles away behind a small deserted island three of Mizu no Kuni warships and two Kiri warships were lying in wait for the ship carrying Princess Saki. On board the lead ship a young crewman was running through the ship heading towards the Commodore, a commander of more than one ship, on the command point of the ship. Sir. The shark units that you had sent to scout out for the royal ship has just reported in that they have sighted the royal ship carrying the princess of Umi no Kuni only three miles away from us, said the young crewman as he saluted to the Commodore of the squadron. Very good signal all ships to move out and have the shinobi forces on board the ships as well as have all the men to get ready for battle ordered the Commodore to the crewman. The crewman saluted again and ran off to do as the Commodore order after which the Commodore then turned to the man that he had been talking to before the crewman arrived with the news. It seems that everything is going as planned will your men be ready and do their job right? asked the Commodore to the man. Of course they will just make sure that your men do not destroy that ship the princess is on when you fire on it she is no good dead and without her our plan is ruined said the man called Isarugi Rejuda. I know that. Just make sure that you and your men do your job besides I heard that the Umi Daimyo has hired a team of highly skilled ninjas from Konoha to protect his daughter said the Commodore to Rejuda. Ha! Huh. Konoha is nothing but a shadow of its former self it is weak now by the time this day is done we will have the princess and everyone will know that the shinobis of Konoha are inferior to those of Kiri sneered Rejuda. We shall see Rejuda we shall see said the Commodore as he walk away from Rejuda to get his men all ready to move out and for battle. Rejuda just ignored the Commodore last comment, Isarugi Rejuda was the last remaining loyal member of the current Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu, Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, since one of the former members was a S-class missing ninja and part of the famed organization of S-class missing ninja the Akatsuki. Two of the other members of the Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu that had also gone missing nin were dead both and had been both killed by ninjas from Konoha. Momochi Zabuza had been killed about ten years ago in a battle against the famed Kopi Ninja, Kopi Ninja, Hitaki Kakashi in Nami no Kuni along with his bloodline freak of a partner Haku. 
The other member Kurosuke Raiga had been killed by the famed Anbu captain the Okami Ken no Konoha, Ten Ten's nickname, four years ago back when she was just an ordinary Anbu agent. It seemed that Raiga had taken over Katabami gold mine in the river country running his own little gang and was burying people alive to satisfy his sick little fantasies with having funerals, somehow the villagers had sent word for help to Konoha where they sent the Okami Ken no Konoha to deal with which she did, he even heard that like Zabuza, Raiga had a bloodline wielding freak as a partner who was now living in the village where Raiga was killed by the Okami Ken no Konoha. Ha! No wonder that Weekly was able to get into the Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu with one of those freaks helping him, serves both him and Zabuza right letting those freaks live and using them to make them stronger the only good bloodline user is a dead one, the world would be better off without them all thought Rejuda. The two other members of the Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu were both bloodline users and when the bloodline crusade began they both became missing Nin as well. Not that Rejuda cared since he had never like either of them he even heard that as they fled the country they found a squad of bloodline hunters killing a family of Hyaten users where they killed most of the squad and took in the only survivor and young boy. Figures that those two would do something like that freaks like them usually stick together pulse they were always too noble to get the job done when it was needed like killing kids thought as he scoffed at the thought of the two former members. The one other remaining member of the of the Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu that was with Rejuta and the others went and betrayed Kiri and joined the rebel factions against the Umi Daimyo and the Godem Mizukage he was even later on joined the last surviving member of the old Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu who were formed after all the members of the original Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu were killed. Traitors the lot of them but it does not matter soon enough the rest of them will be all dead and Kiri's glory will soar once again once Konoha is destroyed and I will be its hero and will reform the Kiri no Shinobigatana Nananan Shu in my image thought Rejuta as he smiled evilly. Soon my time will come thought Rejuta as he walled down to the main deck to get ready for the attack. One hour later on board the royal ship currently Kurinai and Sakura were talking to the princess about what life in Konoha was like. Lee was showing pictures of his daughter to some of the guards and talking about her youthfulness, much to the guards' annoyance with hearing the words flames of youth or youthfulness over and over again. While Choji was happily munching on the food that the ship's cook had given him, suddenly a cry from the man on the crow's nest was heard by everyone on the ship. Ships ahoy! Ships ahoy! cried the man. Quickly everyone went and looked at all sides of the ship to find where the ships were in which they saw them in the distant from behind them. How many ships are there? shouted the captain of the ship. There are five of them and they are all warships and they are heading for us answered the man. This got everyone worried five warships were headed for them. Are they pirates? asked the captain which was what everyone else was thinking. No answered the man then who are they? shouted back the captain. They are from Mizu no Kuni and two of them have the symbol of Kirigakure on them said the man. What are ships belonging to Mizu no Kuni and Kirigakure doing this far south? Axed the captain out loud. They must be after the princess that the only possibility they must want her to hold her for ransom or hold her as a prisoner to force both Umi no Kuni and Tasuki no Kuni into doing whatever they want them to do said Kuranai as she went up to the captain. If that is the case they we cannot allow them to capture me I refuse to allow myself to be used as a political pawn to force both my father and Hikaru Kun to bend to the will of that tyrant the Mizu Daimyo answered Princess Saki. Do not worry princess we will protect you and we will make sure that they never lay a hand on you answered the captain of the guard. Captain can this ship outrun those warships? asked princess Saki. Of course princess this is the fastest ship in the southern sea there no way they will be able to outrun this ship said the captain confidently. He then turned and started to shout out orders to the rest of the crew to get the ship moving faster. Soon enough the main sails for the ship were let loose and the ship started to gain speed and were gaining distance from the warships but just when they thought that they were going to get away suddenly twelve shinobis exploded out of the water and landed on the deck of the ship. The twelve shinobis all wore air breathing masks most likely to breath underwater for long periods of time, they also all wore anbu like armor and gear and had kiri headbands on their heads and had a small kanji symbol for shark on the top left hand side of their armor. Watch out they are with Kiri's shark unit the Kiri's elite underwater fighting unit there are experts in both open sea combat and underwater combat. You men surround the princess and guard her we handle them ourselves order Kurinai as she got into an fighting stance along with Lee and Sakura while Choji pulled out his axe that he wore on his back. The guards quickly followed Kurinai orders and made a circle around her protecting her with their bodies with their swords out ready to defend the princess with their very lives if need be. 
with Karanai Karanai quickly went off and faced two shark members in which she quickly started to do some hand seals for a jutsu the two shark members went to attack her but just before they could get to her she finished her seals and disappeared. Where did she go? asked one of the shark members as they turned their heads around to look for her. But before his partner could answer they found themselves being wrapped around by tree-like vines that that seemed to spring right out of the deck of the ship and a tree then sprang right behind them and they were tied to it by the vines. Before the two shark members could even try and escape Karanai suddenly came out of the tree like a flower blooming out of a flower tree, she then quickly slit both men's throats with her kanai after which the tree disappeared and the two men dropped dead with Karni standing right behind them wiping away the men's blood with a cloth. After which an explosion happened on the deck and Karanai quickly turned to see what had happened. With Sakura Sakura was also busy fighting two shark nins herself where she quickly rolled out of the way of a Mizurapa Jutsu, violent water wave technique fired at her by one of the shark nins as she did the other shark member charged her and was about to stab her with his kanai. Sakura then quickly did a low spin kick causing the shark nin to fall on his back onto the deck of the ship. Sakura then quickly jumped back onto her feet and charged at the still standing shark nin with her fist raised in the air. The shark unfortunately could not dodge in time and Sakura hit him right in the face and with her superhuman strength which sent him right out of the ship and back into the open sea. She then turned around to deal with the remaining shark nin which was lucky since she was then able to see an incoming kanai and was able to leap into the air in time to avoid the incoming kanai that was thrown by the other shark nin at her. The shark member then looked up into the air and was just in time to see a drop axe kick falling right onto his head which was coming from a falling sakura and was then sent face first right into the deck of the ship where the power from sakura's superhuman strength sent him right through the deck of the ship and crashed right into the bottom floor of the ship. Sakura the just wiped the dust off herself pleased with herself with dealing with the two men easily enough. But suddenly Sakura attention was focused on the explosion in the middle of the of the ship deck. With Li Li quickly engaged three shark nins and by using his great speed to his advantage he quickly delivered a hard bunch right into the face of an unsuspected shark nin where he was sent crashing right into one of the lower masts. Lee the quickly ducked an upper slash attack from a tonto sword from one of the other shark nins where had he not ducked it would have cut his head right off. Lee then disappeared and reappeared behind the attacking shark nin where he then cried out Konoha Senpu, leaf whirlwind, and then did a spinning kick which hit the surprised shark nin in the side of the head and sent him right across the ship and crashing right into the water. Lee the turned to the remaining shark nin I wear the remaining shark nin got his kanai in hand and went to charge at Lee where in a second or two he had already spilt the gap between them in half. As the shark nin was halfway to him Lee then disappeared but before the shark nin could fully comprehend what had happened he felt an enormous amount of pain in his stomach which almost made him black out from the pain. The shark nin felt like he had been kicked by a donkey when he looked down he saw that Lee kneeing down with his fist in the shark nin's stomach. When the Lee removed his fist from the shark member's stomach and stood up in front of him the shark member just keeled over onto the deck of the ship and blacked out. Just when Lee thought the fight was done his shinobi senses kicked in and he ducked his head where had he not he would have been hit by several shurikens in the back of the head that were sent by the first shark nin he had hit who had just regained his bearings from being hit into the lower mast of the ship by Lee's sudden attack. Seeing that Li had ducked his shuriken attack the shark nin quickly began to do some hand seals for a jutsu attack. But before the shark nin could finish the last seal. For his jutsu Li quickly ran across the deck of the ship to the shark nin and hit him with a konoha shofu, leaf. Rising wind. And sending the shark nin into the air where Li then used his cage buyo, shadow of the dancing leaf. Where Li then appeared behind Shark Nin and hit him in a pressure point on his back to paralyzing him for a few seconds, where Li then quickly wrapped his bandages around the Shark Nin body, and when they reached the point where they would start to falling, they started to spin like a spinning top in a clockwise direction as they were falling. In which just before they both hit the deck of the Li move away from the man, and the Shark Nin crashed head first into the deck of the ship and went right through it into the bottom part of the ship, creating a large hole on the main deck of the ship. Li then just looked down through the hole in the deck of the ship to see the man now unconscious on the bottom floor of the ship which caused Li to smile to himself at his win. This did not last long when suddenly an explosion caught his attention on the deck of the ship. With Choji Choji quickly raised his large battle axe to block a shuriken attack from the two shark nins he was battling, he had tired for a few minutes to hit the two shark nins with his battle axe but they dodged it every time. 
quickly realizing that swinging his battle axe at the two shark nins was getting him nowhere he slammed the head of his axe onto the deck of the ship sticking the axe to the deck of the ship. Choji then quickly uses his Bubenbaika no Jutsu, partial multi-size technique, to expand his arms to giant size, so that they were big enough and long enough to grab hold of and lift the two shark nins, and once they were, he quickly grabbed them both, where he then slammed both men together stunning and then said. Sorry guys since neither of you have your boarding passes I going to have to ask you both to leave the ship. After which he then threw the two shark members out into the air and out to the open sea. Happy landings cried Choji as he smiled but that faded when an explosion on the deck happened and he turned to see what happened. General viewpoint unfortunately the shark nins that Lee, Kurinai, Sakura and Choji had been fighting were just a distraction to they keep the Konoha team busy until the remaining three other shark nins accomplish their main objective which was to destroy the main mast of the ship and make sure that the ship did not get away from the oncoming warships. The three remaining shark nins quickly covered the lower and middle part of the ship main mast with exploding tags and once they had done that they set off the tags causing an explosion and for the main mast collapses on the deck of the ship and the fall into the sea. The three remaining shark nins then quickly jumped back into the sea since they had accomplished the main objective of their mission. As soon as the Konoha team saw the main mast explode and fall into the sea they realized that they had been duped they realized that shark nins they fought were just to distract them while the other members destroyed the main mast slowing the ship down so that the Mizu and Kiri warships could catch up with them. Damn it they weren't after the princess they were after the main mast I should have seen that coming, we should have been protecting it said Kurinai cursing herself for being duped so easily. Kurinai-san what do we do now? Axed Sakura, there nothing we can do with the main mast gone there is no chance whatsoever in outrunning those warships now. The best we can do now is try and fight them off since if they want the princess they are going to have to board it, but even then I don't like our chances especially if they have a lot more shinobi on those ships which I willing to bet they do answered Kurinai as she frowned and was trying to think of a way to get themselves and the princess out of this mess and so far she was coming up with noting. Suddenly they heard some blasts coming from two of the warships when everyone turned towards the ships they saw things flying through the air towards them and they quickly realized that the things that were flying through the air towards them were kanais, hundreds of kanais. Take cover yelled Choji as everyone started to take cover behind different things on the ship many of the guards even used the own bodies to protect the princess. But none of the kanais hit the ship all the kanais hit the water around the ship and once they did they exploded causing large amounts of water to be splashed onto the ship soaking many people on board, once it was all over everyone got out of their covering spots. Are you alright princess are you hurt? asked the captain of the guard worriedly. No I fine thank you Captain Yamaka answered Princess Saki as she got up from being on the floor of the deck when her guards used their bodies to try and cover her. Shit. They're using exploding kanai. What the hell? Are trying to kill us? Cried Choji. Well if they are they are doing a pretty bad job since they missed us said Sakura. No that was just a warning telling us that they have the power to kill us all if they want to and to intimidate us answered Kuranai. But what was it that they just used on use to fire all those exploding kanai at us? Axed Lee. I am not exactly sure but I might have an idea and I hope I wrong because if I am right we have no chance of surviving this and it will do a lot of damage to Konoha in the coming battles against Kiri, said Kuranai as she was clearly worried with the current situation they were in right now. It did not take long for the warships to get to them and surround their ship. Although the princess guards prepared to battle as did the Konoha team and the crew of the ship they were still vastly outnumbered. They also soon saw the volley guns on board two of the warships and they were loaded with more kanai and were aimed at them also there were at least a hundred Mizu warriors on boards the ships all armed with swords, spears, bows and arrows, also on the ships were sixty kiri ninja many of them were carrying several strange looking weapons in their arms, imagine the weapons that the sky ninjas used in the second Naruto Shippuden movie. Wait. I know those things I seen things like that when I was in Haru, Yuki no Kuni said Sakura in surprise when she saw the volley guns. Yes you would have I imagine, said Kuranai with a frown since her fears had been confirmed. But how did Kiri get them since they belong to Haru, Yuki no Kuni and since they are members of the Heavenly Alliance and allies to Kumo they would never give Kiri their weapons since the Godem Mizukage hates the Rokudame Rakage and he would use those weapons against him and Kumo as well as the rest of the Heavenly Alliance said Sakura. That because they didn't, you see a few years ago Jiraiya Sama reported a rumor he had heard. That when you and your team mates defeated the daimyo of Haru, 
Yuki no Kuni Kazahana Dodo a member of his inner circle had escaped the country with some plans on one of the weapons that Dodo created, where the member then later on sold it to Kiri. The rumor was never confirmed due to Kirigakir never showed any signs of having it, but had tightened up security in the village and kept certain docking ports in Umi no Kuni closed off from most people answered Kurinai. Suddenly a man in samurai armor appeared on top of the command point of the Mizu warship and began to speak. Attention all crewmen and warriors of Umi no Kuni as well as Konoha shinobis as you can see we have you completely surrounded, you have seen what our volley guns can do and they are now all aimed at you I suggest that you all surrender now and save your lives there need be no more bloodshed and lives lost today spoke the man in armor. You would not dare fire those things at us since you clearly want to take the princess as your prisoner since you purposely missed us when you fired your volley guns earlier. If you fire them now you will not only kill us all but the princess as well said Kuranai as she stepped forward to make herself known. After which a Kiri ninja then took aim and fired the strange weapon in his hand and fired several kanais at Kuranai's feet causing her to step back in shock not expecting something like that to happen. The man in armor then held up his hand to the ninja signaling to him to hold his fire. Although what you say is true Konoha Shinobi-san as you can see for yourself we also have handheld versions of the volley guns and kanai luanchers they are much more accurate and just as deadly. Not to mention we can also board your ship from all sides and we vastly outnumber your group, hence you have no chance of defeating us and we will just take Princess Saki in the end with force so I ask you again to surrender now and save your lives you will not be harmed I give you my word, I will give you 30 seconds to make your decision, said the man in armor. Just as the man in armor had just stopped speaking someone shouted. Wait. Where Princess Saki walked out from behind her guards and stood in front of them to speak to the man in armor. Princess please get back behind us spoke Captain Yamaka as he tried to get her back behind him, but she just brushed him off. Although I would rather die than become a political pawn to be used against my father and Hikaru Kun I will not allow all these people die needlessly to try and protect me. If you give me your word as an officer which you clearly are, that you will not harm any of these people and you let them go I will surrender myself to you without resistance, spoke Princess Saki standing with an aura of nobility and confidence around her and speak without the slightness bit of hesitation or nervousness in her voice. Princess you can't do this please don't do it, cried Captain Yamaka as he tried to stop her from surrendering herself to them. Princess Saki held up her hand to Captain Yamaka face to tell him to stop and then said. Captain this is my decision and I order you to stand down spoke the princess in a voice of authority one that only a true ruler would have. Captain Yamaka at first did or said nothing, but eventually lowered his head in complacence and answered very well princess this is your decision and I will do as you say after which he stepped back from her. Princess Saki then looked to the man in armor again who had been watching the whole ordeal with interest and spoke with just as much confidence as she did before and said. Do we have an agreement then? The man in armor then nodded his head in agreement and said. We do in which I Commodore Fuji Kazan of Mizu no Kuni Royal Fleet do hereby give you my word that no harm will come to any of the other people on your ship and I will let them go freely said Commodore Kazan. After the agreement was made Princess Saki had all the her guards as well as the ship crew and Kurinai and the others to lower their weapons and surrender to the now boarding Mizu warriors and Kiri ninjas. Soon enough everyone on board the Umi royal ship was rounded up in one large group and they had their hands in the air as a sign of their surrender with Mizu warriors and the Kiri ninjas all pointing their weapons at the surrendering crew and ninjas, the princess herself stood up in front of the group with two Mizu samurai with her in the middle between the two. Soon enough Commodore Kazan boarded the ship himself with another large man who looked like a bodybuilder with brown hair with a narrowing face and looked like some overgrow street thug to the Konoha ninjas. He carried a large samurai katana on his side he wore a standard purple jonin flak jacket with tradition shinobi pants and sandals he wore his headband of kiri on his right bicep and wore a grey hooded cloak that had the kanji kill on it, the two of them soon made themselves up to the princess where the man then spoke first. My name is Isarugi Reijuda last remaining loyal member of the kiri no shinobi katana nananin shu and commander of the shinobi forces you see here. He then quickly cupped Princess Saki face with his large right hand and her look directly look into his face, Captain Yamaka and several of the guards flinched as they saw this since they wanted noting more that to attack Rejuda for touching the princess in such a way but they knew they could do noting in the current situation they were in. It was very noble of you to offer yourself up to us to allow the others to live, then again I should expect something like that from a princess such as yourself said Rejuda. He then looked down at Saki body and then at her face and had a lecherously like grin on his face not bad, 
although you're a tad bit skinny for my taste, but you're still quite pretty then again I should expect that from someone of royalty like you. Saki then quickly smacked away his large hand, don't you dare touch me she hissed at him violently at him. Ha, 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 ha laughed Rejuta and feisty too I like that, the prince of Tasuki no Kuni is a lucky man to get someone like you. Enough yelled Commodore Kazan and he but himself between Princess Saki and Rejuta. Rejuta you will treat Princess Saki with the respect she deserves said Commodore Kazan with a forceful tone as he glared at Rejuta angrily where he then turned and spoke to the princess. Princess Saki please forgive Rejuta he clearly lacks any form of courtesy or manners. To which Rejuta just scoffed at Commodore K's remark. Although you are now our prisoner you will be treated with the respect you deserve, hence I would like to offer you my quarters for you to stay in as long as you are on my ship said Commodore Kazan politely to the princess. Thank you Commodore Kazan for your generous offer which I will accept but what of my guards, my ship crew and the Konoha ninjas? asked Princess Saki. They shall be not be harmed and they will all be released as I promised Princess said Commodore Kazan. All except for the Konoha shinobis interrupted Rejuda. Rejuda you are out of line. I gave the princess my word of honor that I would let everyone else on this ship go if she surrendered peacefully, which she did and I intend to keep my word rounded Commodore Kazan. You may have given your word to the princess, but I did not besides this is a shinobi matter where you have no say in the matter since Kiri and Konoha are at war with one another these four are prisoners of war, said Rejuta as he pointed at Kuriani, Lee, Sakura and Choji and had his men single them out and surrounded them. Besides I would be a fool to let such valuable prisoners as these four get away since the one in green is Rock Lee Konoha Naidame no Ketakai Aoimoju one of Konoha top Jonin fighters and husband to the clan head of the Karama clan. The one in armor is Akamichi Choji Konoha no Kyojin Keud and heir to the head of the Akamichi clan as well as member of the Neo Ino Shika Cho. The red eye beauty is Yuhi Serutobi Koreani Konoha famed Genjutsu specialist, former wife of the late Serutobi Asuma of the Kazuma in the Shugonin Junishi and aunt to Konoha no Enku Serutobi Konohamaru and the one with the pink hair is Haruno Sakura Konoha Chiyu Sakura and apprentice of the Godem Hokage. These four will have a great deal of valuable information that could be very useful to Kiri in the war against Konoha said Rejuta as he walked over to the Konoha shinobis. No matter what you do to us we will never talk and we will never betray our village spoke Sakura definitely after which Rejuta just cupped her face and said. Brave words, but you will eventually break, Kiri shinobis are very good in getting information out of people and when we have gotten all the information that we want from you we will then have a little fun together. I will especially enjoy having some fun with you Kuranai san said Rejuta as he let go of Sakura face and then cupped Kuranai face in his large hands. I must say you are much more beautiful in person than you are in your picture in the Kiri bingo book said Rejuta where Kuranai gave him the most hateful look she could muster at him. She had heard of Rejuta who was not only famed for his power and skill as a swordsman in Kiri but also for his brutality and cruelty to people in the Mizu no Kuni in Kirigakir in its current civil war he was known for his strong hatred of bloodlines and for killing the entire families of people who were against either the Godem Mizukaj or the Mizu Daimyo. When Rejuta saw the look that Kuranai was giving him he just laughed. Good. I like women who are feisty it just makes it all the better when I break them in the end and they always do in the end said Rejuta as he smirks when Kuranai just continues to glare at him with all the hate she could muster in herself. Rejuta then turned to Sakura and eyed the curves of her body and shape of it and eyed her lecherously, as he did Sakura could not help be feel that she needed a shower as he looked at her. Perhaps after I done breaking Kuranai san here I will come to visit you then Miss Haruno said Rejuta with the same lecherously grin on his face as he held a handful of Sakura pink hair and ran it through his fingers. This caused Sakura to shudder and then glare at the man with just as much hatred as Kuranai had show him which Rejuta just laughed at after which he turned to some Kiri nins around them. You men, take the prisoners to the brig, order Rejuta to the shinobis around the Konoha nin which the Kiri nin did as they were told. As they were being brought on board to one of the Kiri warships all four of them knew what would happen once they reach Mizu no Kuni. They would be put in one of Kiri prisons where they would be interrogated. Tortured and raped, in Kuranai and Sakura case, for all the information that they had about Konoha, after which they would either be left to rot in prison where they would never see the light of day again or they would be killed and buried in some unmarked grave outside the prison and that was if they were lucky, since there was also very little chance of rescue coming from their village due to the situation that it was in now with fighting off Otto, Iwa, Kiri, Kusa and the Hanya clan. 
The four Konoha nins lowered their heads in defeat as they walked on to the Kiri warship they had failed to protect the princess where she would be used as a political pawn in the Godem Mizukage and the Mizu Daimyo schemes. They had failed to help their village to gain the badly needed trade alliance with Umi no Kuni and Tasuki no Kuni and worst of all they had failed to come back to their loved ones where Sakura would never see her parents again, Choji would never see his parents or his wife again. Lee would never see his daughter or wife again and Kuranai would never see her son again they had all lost hope in ever seeing their loved ones again. Thanks for watching.